All right, we're not late. We are live on Myth Vision Podcast. I'm excited about tonight's show. We're going to be discussing something to do with anthropology. But first, my guest, Erica from Guts at Gibbon. How are you? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. I'm hydrated. I'm in my lane. I'm vibing. And I'm ready to talk a little bit about uh, out of Africa and anthropology. I think this is going to be a fun one. Absolutely. Just so everybody knows, as we're getting started, she has a YouTube channel. Please go consider subscribing to. She started it not too long ago, actually, but she pumps out content as she's constantly <laughs> studying. You're right now in you're in college. What are you studying for? And you're working to get your PhD, I think, too. So, Yeah, yeah. So I got my BSA, uh, my undergraduate degree in pre-professional animal science. So I was planning on being a veterinarian. So I took a whole lot of chemistry and physics that I now have absolutely no use for. While I was an undergrad, I picked up an, a minor in anthropology and another minor in biology, which spurred me to try to combine these two in a sort of a sort of Dragon Ball Z style fusion. And I went and got my master's of research in primate biology, behavior and conservation over in London. So my, my background is pretty heavily inserted into um, other primates, extant primates, extinct primates, things like that. But fortunately, since humans are primates and I am currently pursuing my uh, PhD, I'm a first year PhD student, so I'm just finishing my first year uh, and I'm about to finish getting a graduate level uh, course accreditation in uh, hominid evolution, which is taught by someone who I, I'm not going to dox myself, but someone who's very active in the field, which is which is great. I think that makes me um, pretty pretty laser target focused as far as the talk to the topic we're going to be talking about today, which is human evolution out of Africa, primates, um, and sort of where where it is that we come from and what support do we have for mm. that. So a couple things. She has a Patreon. You can go support her at, especially after this episode. If you really liked what you heard, you can get a lot more information. You can also message her that way and contact her through the Patreon. It helps her go to school and continue her education, doing what she's doing. And eventually when you get your PhD, I'd like to do some online courses with you. In yeah. particular, educating people on evolution, human evolution in particular, of course, to get to that point, because that seems to be a a huge hot topic for anyone who holds to sacred myths and uh, ancient stories about our origins. No one likes to think we came from uh, some type of ape or monkey or chimpanzees are related to us in some way. There, there's a big concern there for many people. You know, I came from the young earth creationist background mm -hmm. as a fundamentalist. So uh, please go support her. We have the Patreon as well. The topic today, the show and the video we really want to discuss is on a channel by Robert Seffer. I'm hoping I'm saying his name correctly. Per, per, perhaps his stands in side chat can let us know if we're uh, if we're properly um, giving the man himself credit. Okay. Yeah, this is the video debunking out of Africa. I've properly plugged him down in the description. And uh, yeah, we're going to watch this. Of course, I had to do a few tweaks because the YouTube world is fishy. And if for whatever reason, Robert felt offended or didn't like the video, we want to make sure that people aren't trying to pull the plug and ruin the opportunity of us being able to review something that we do find. And we're going to be critical. Uh, we're going to be critical of the view. We're going to give credit where credit's due. If something's accurate, we want to say it's accurate. If it's not, we want to say why it's not, why it's not. And I really want everybody in the chat to hold on with your questions and such, if possible, till the end. Uh, we'll do Q&A hangout. You want to challenge her? Bring it. Uh, she is all for challenging. Trust me. Uh, she loves a good fight. Uh, when I interviewed you, you're like, ah, bring it. Uh, anyway, where do you, where do we go? You want to you want to start playing the clip or did you want to say something before we get started? Yeah, um, I, I would like to say kind of one thing moving forward. So. Robert, and I'm just going to be referring to him as Robert moving forward to just avoid the snafus with potentially butchering his last name, because I know how that goes. That can be irritating. Uh, but Robert is, he proclaims himself to be an anthropologist. Now, I'm going to be a little bit in mean mode today. For those of you who maybe follow me, I, I don't tend to go into mean mode unless I feel like someone is perhaps dipping a toe into bad faith acting. That's something I'm a little concerned about with Robert. Uh, he says he's an anthropologist, but as we will see in the video, which which I have I have seen and annotated, there are some mistakes that that are you know found in this video that I cannot see someone graduating with an anthropology degree making. Um, now maybe maybe Robert does have an anthropology degree. Um, I really gave it my all and swept the internet to see if I could find any any trace of him. 
I couldn't find anything. That doesn't mean he's not an anthropologist. That doesn't mean that he didn't graduate from where he said he graduated from. And I'm not going to say because I'm not going to try to dox him. Uh, but that being said, uh, we're going to touch on some points that I think make that a little hard to believe. And I just want to say moving forward that we're going to go ahead and treat him like he is an anthropologist, even though okay. I myself doubt that. We're just going to take him at his word and we're going to say, yeah, OK, Robert. Robert, anthropologist, he he only claims that he graduated with his bachelor's, so he's got a bachelor's in anthropology. Let's just go ahead and take him in his work and see where that takes us. And just so everybody knows, why I found interest, I've been subscribed to Robert for quite some time, and sometimes we cover uh, strange, mystical figures in history, you know, Madame Bla uh, Blavatsky. Uh, we talk about ancient mythologies, things like that come up. I think Robert believes there's more to them than what I would. I think these are ancient stories mostly. Uh, myth is a story that's being told. Oftentimes, I don't think there's real facts to most of it. There may be a kernel of truth to reality in some of it. Oftentimes, it's anachronistically written in a way as if they're really there, but they're not. And we find those things. So I'm very critical of the myths, and it seems maybe he has more of a different stance. And so I followed him for a very long time and even tried to interview with him in the past. I've wrote Robert, and he said, I don't really interview with other people. I could probably see why now, because when people don't agree with the stance, then they could turn on you and things like that, whatever. Um, this isn't a turn on Robert. This is, I saw his out of Africa video the other day. I don't watch every video he does, but I clicked it and I said, hold on. Um, this is definitely in the field of one of my dear friends, Erica. And I want to get her thoughts on this because some of these things raised serious red flags from Atlantis to uh aquarian it was the uh, aquatic uh ape theory or is am i saying that right yeah uh, yeah <laughs> these, aquatic these, hypothesis yes hypothesis so yeah these things red flag i said hold on robert has you know what three hundred forty thousand people two hundred forty thousand people on, on one channel he has a whole nother channel with 230 something thousand and that like people love them right so they believe everything he says and we have oftentimes there's people on the internet have massive followings like this and it's almost like a cult following. I mean, I'm sure there's people even that watch me or you. If we made a mistake, they probably won't check it. They won't catch it. They'll believe what we're saying. Oftentimes, I even try to teach my audience to check everything I'm saying. Don't buy what I'm saying. Investigate, because that's why I interview other academics, PhDs and experts in the field, and really challenge even my own thinking on these issues going in. Anyway, I rambled there just to make the point, if a quarter of a million people are following, I think it's important to go, you know, what is he saying? And why are so many people following these uh, ideas and not actually looking into what mainstream academics have to say? So we'll play the clip and I will pause it every time you have something to say or I have something to say. At the end, we'll get to super chats and things like that. Yeah, I imagine that this is this this video is in its non kind of trimmed down format. It's like 10, 13 minutes long. But that being said, um, there's a lot to cover. Uh, so I imagine that we are going to be stopping at least relatively frequently. If folks in the chat feel like we're stopping too often, let let Derek know. I'm not watching the chat because I I get I get fighty. I try to post up with chatters when I see you know yeah, challenges yeah, yeah. going on over there. So <laughs> I I've got, I don't have the chat pulled up, but let Derek know. Uh, I certainly don't want to ruin the flow with my incessant interrupting. <laughs> Yeah, there's some red flags that are going to come up in this video as well. I hope we touch on when we get there. So uh, we're not talking about you, Robert Herring, so don't worry, my friend. Uh, but yes, let's uh, get started. And I shortened it because I sped it up. I reversed it. I mirrored it. I put it within something. I'm trying to protect the channel because you never know. Um, I also kind of mimicked something he did when he was reviewing a different channel, the same TV setup. So here, here we go. Let's see what we got. In appreciation of a lecture right. I gave last Bear with me. Here we go. This is how it starts. And let's the American Anthropological Association designated February 18th as World Anthropologist Day. And I was sent a gift certificate for a free meal at Red Lobster Restaurant in appreciation of a lecture I gave last month for a private organization, which is all Stop. I can think about as I stay. Okay. Thing number one. Um, so the American Anthropological Association, totally legit thing. But one thing that immediately rang my alarm bells while I was listening to this the first time is that seamless transition and from saying there's this anthropological society is a thing. They sent out all these Red Lobster gift certificates. I got one for a private lecture that I did. 
right? Now, as far as I am aware, and I just got back from an, a, an anthropology conference back in March, late March, the AABA is the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. There were no private lectures being given there, at least none that I was aware of. Everything is public record. In fact, in order to actually present at the AABAs, you have to publish an abstract that shows up and is available online. My abstract is available online for the poster that I presented there. So alarm bells should be going off anytime you hear about privacy and things like that, uh, because science is meant to be open access, meant to be big underline in that open access, but at least at the very least, it's meant to be open access for other scientists and colleagues so they can kind of peer review your work because that's like the most important thing for, for science is the ability to peer review. So private lecture, a little bit of a red flag, but let's keep going. Okay. They're out into the ocean reflecting on ancient history and of course, fresh seafood. Anthropology is the scientific study of people, past and present, with a focus on understanding the human condition, both culturally and biologically. In America, the curriculum is divided into four parts, including archeology, span consisting of the analysis of unearthed artifacts and other physical remains, linguistics, which deals with all aspects of language and its origins, culture, meaning traditions, customs, and behavior, and of course, genetics, pertaining to human biological diversity, DNA, racial origins, and evolutionary theory. So I stop. Just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so <laughs> it's really weird to me that he's got this, and perhaps a little telling, you know, he's got this video debunking out of Africa, which of course does fall under the purview of biological anthropology. The four fields of anthropology, and I teach a lab about biological anthropology that accompanies the, the lecture portion taught by the, you know, the actual professors. The first lecture we teach is titled Introduction to Anthropology. We talk about the four sub-disciplines of anthropology and those disciplines, he got the first three right, cultural, linguistic, archeological, but the last one is called biological anthropology because it's not just about genetics. It's myriad of different fields that are interdisciplinary in nature, right? So you've got paleoanthropology, primatology, things like biomechanic studies. Yeah, things like genetics, taphonomic studies that all intermingle um, in order to actually give a better picture of human evolution as a whole. To relegate it to genetics uh, is also very telling of how he's about to handle some of the fossils that he brings up. Mm. All right, moving on. And while various hypotheses pertaining to humanity's origins are discussed at the university level, the out of Africa theory is heavily favored despite compounding evidence to the contrary. Because Okay, and we're gonna get into this compounding evidence to the contrary of this theory he's going to mention political like he, he thinks there's, there's just a secret agenda it was like a conspiratorial type mindset but let's let him say that. it seems to support other, a social hmm? other quotes i've seen him use are like straight up afrocentric marxism is like a phrase that i've seen him use which is hmm it just kind of makes you go huh and uh and put put your ears on uh on high alert for what's coming next all right engineering political agenda rather than a scientific one another theory which is touched upon is called the aquatic ape which i covered in a prior video that postulates that mankind did not necessarily come about from monkeys and great apes but may have shared a common ancestor that evolved around water whether okay, on the surface of the earth so quick note there Saying the aquatic ape theory like it is anywhere in the same tri-state area as out of Africa is insane. Out of Africa is nearly universally accepted, at least out of Africa, as in the roughly 50 to 70,000 year ago uh, departure of anatomically modern-ish homo sapiens from Africa and dispersing it out into the world. This is pretty universally accepted by people. The aquatic ape hypothesis, on the other hand, is like the fringe of the fringe within conventional, quote unquote, biological anthropology. Something that he said there that, you know, and I know I keep saying this, but it keeps coming up, right, that is getting my alarm bells going, is saying that the aquatic ape hypothesis doesn't state that humans evolve from a monkey or an ape, but rather something that lives, you know, in these kind of coastal areas or, and he's going to say this in a second, subterranean caves. If you had actually read the aquatic ape theory, you would know that we still do come from previous catarine monkeys in the aquatic ape hypothesis. You're not doing a ground up evolution from something that isn't a primate, that isn't an anthropoid, that isn't you know a catarine 
up from you know a single cellular organism in the sea. This this isn't what's happening. That's not what was proposed by the uh, the the individual who proposed the aquatic ape theory, which hypothesis, excuse me, which I, I forget her name right now. Uh, but yeah, that's that's seriously concerning, and, and you'll continue to see this. Clearly, Robert doesn't think humans are apes. He doesn't think that we're primates, and that's also concerning because that implies that he doesn't know basic taxonomy, why things are placed where they are, the nature of monophyly, how nested hierarchies even work. It's just concerning, to say the least. By lakes, rivers, and oceans, or in subterranean caverns, which also contain similar bodies of water, with some upright walking hominins later taking to the trees to evolve into branch climbing monkeys or fur covered apes. And while this may sound counterintuitive, mainly because- Yeah, so, so quick note there, um, just in case people are wondering, like humans taxonomically speaking are both monkeys and apes, right? Which would mean apes are also both monkeys and apes. Uh, when I say monkeys, I mean we are catarine primates, which catarines, it literally means like downward turned nostril monkey. Uh, anthropoid is, is similarly monkeys that are not tarsiers or strepsirans, things like that. Now, colloquially, when we say monkey, we usually mean like this is a primate with a tail and an ape is a primate that doesn't have a tail. But taxonomically, things get a little bit more a little bit more complicated. So it's kind of concerning, right, that Robert is talking about this without yielding appreciation, giving appreciation, I guess I should say, uh, for how these nested hierarchies are based on physical characteristics and genetic suites as well. So like, why are we primates? What characteristics do we have that, that all primates have, right? It's aspects of our mobile wrists, our mobile shoulders, our mobile ankles so that we can maneuver around in the trees. It's flat nails instead of claws. It's big brains for our body size. You can go down the list. What makes us an anthropoid? What makes us a catarine? And whether or not humans are included in going down this list and categorizing organisms within primates as an order, you still end up with these same nested groups with suites of characteristics that unite them. Then when you say, where should we put humans, humans without fail fall down the line with order primates, right? Anthropoids, catarines, hominids, hominins, and homo sapiens. This is not something that is avoidable. In fact, there is no way to categorize life uniformly and not have humans nest within the primates all the way down to, to being another great ape. So this is something that if Robert is planning on overturning the entirety of human evolution, you might want to have a good grasp of, because he's going to have to make that argument eventually if he's the, as he calls himself, the most dangerous anthropologist, right? How about, how about do something a little dangerous and, and rewrite taxonomy? But then you would have to be able to do that, right? And there is no way to actually rework these suites of characteristics in a uniform way for the rest of primates and somehow lump humans outside of it. I'd say this to creationists all the time. It's it's just not, to, to the extent, by the way, Derek, that some creationists, younger creationists that I know, have since caught to the fact that, yeah, okay, humans are apes. Then they say we didn't evolve from other apes, but like morphologically speaking, we have that suite of characteristics that nest us in that group. I almost think, and we're going to get to this statement, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounded like he was almost trying to argue when he uses one of the uh, scholars that apes and monkeys came from humans and not the other way around. Like, like it's backwards is what he's trying to argue. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that, I'm sure. We'll get to that. Okay, cool. Because of decades of media conditioning, the concept does share some parallels among some of the world's foremost geneticists and evolutionary biologist, who may or may not also have received a coupon at Red Lobster. Dr. Owen Lovejoy is a distinguished evolutionary anthropologist at Kent State University, Ohio, best known for his work on Australopithecine, locomotion, and the origins of bipedalism. Lovejoy has published more than 100 articles related to his research and is most well known for his work on reconstructing Lucy, an alleged human ancestor with an opposable big toe on its feet, meaning Pause. they resembled thumbs for Okay, there's a lot to unpack in that small little section. And in fact, this next probably like three minute section has some impressively incorrect paleoanthropology. And this is something that I'm going to be able to show you is incorrect simply by like showing you pictures, which I think is quite cool. So first and foremost, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you here. Hopefully it will go smoothly. And I'm gonna show you this picture 
Can you see this? Yes. All right. So this individual here is a hominin known as Artipithecus raminus. Artipithecus raminus lived 4.4 million years ago. It is a more derived, that is to say, it has more modern, quote unquote, characteristics than the hominins that came before it, the likes of Sehalanthropus chidensis, Aurorantugonensis, and Artipithecus cadaba. One thing that you should note about Artipithecus is that it has a divergent big toe down there at the bottom. Now, what you should also note is that what what our friend Robert just said is that Lovejoy is known for his work on Australopithecines, which have a divergent big toe. Owen Lovejoy has worked with Australopithecus afarensis. Of course, he's done extensive work with Lucy, but he's also worked with Tim White, and Tim White's specialty is Artipithecus ramidus. Artipithecus has this nice divergent big toe that's really quite strange, but it seems to me like he's confusing it with Australopithecus afarensis, whose toes are in line not divergent. This is part of the reason why we know Australopithecus afarensis was a biped, because it had inline big toe, right, an inline halix or big toe, as well as the other suite of bipedal characteristics that coincidentally, other than that divergent toe, Artipithecus rabidus also had. These traits include things like excuse me, an anterior frame and magnum. So the hole at the base of the skull is directly underneath in order to hold the vertebral column directly underneath it for an upright posture or an orthograde posture. Artipithecus ramidus as well as Australopithecus afarensis both have bowl-shaped pelvis in order to anchor powerful gluteal muscles and strengthen the pelvic, the pelvic floor, excuse me. They have valgus knees or knees that hold the weight again directly underneath the body. And Artipithecus has these traits just as Australopithecus afarensis does, just as every other Australopithecine does. Now, something that, that Robert is going to, you know, kind of not say outright but heavily imply is that a lot of this information for Australopithecus afarensis comes from Lucy. Australopithecus afarensis or Lucy having lived 3.7 million years ago, or significantly more recently than Artipithecus rhamnus is 4.4 million years ago. But what he's, I guess, not completely appreciating is the fact that we have more Australopithecine specimens than we know what to do with, comprising well over 300 individuals and comprising, hunt, or excuse me, thousands of specimens, individual specimens, whether it's, you know, an ulna here or metacarpal there. Um, and all of this combined lets us know that, yeah, Australopithecines, not only were they bipeds, they could not have biomechanically been quadrupeds, right? So when they come down from the trees, and make no mistake, they were still doing some stuff in the trees, at least Lovejoy actually would, would agree with me on that one. They still have these curved phalanges, um, and it may be an evolutionary holdover, or it may be that they genuinely are still spending time in the trees for things like nesting or foraging. But when these guys came down to the ground, and we know that they had to often because they lived in a mosaic environment, not a rainforest, so they had to come down to move from tree patch to tree patch. And this is, of course, known from isotopic work that's been relatively extensive for East Africa, that they were moving bipedally on the ground, a striding biped, as some anthropologists have put it. But already Robert has goofed up that, I mean, there's only so many genera in hominin evolution. Sahelanthropus, auroran, Artipithecus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, Kenianthropus, and Homo. That's eight. And you goofed up two of them, right? That's not a good way, that's not a good starting point to be saying you're going to overturn all of paleoanthropology moving forward. Um, so we're going to continue to be talking about these particular hominins, the relationship between Artipithecus, uh, Lovejoy is actually one of the individuals who proposes that Artipithecus is directly ancestral to this individual, or this is actually Africanus, but Australopithecines in general. So boy, it sure is important that we track those bipedal characteristics, given that, uh, given that Robert is saying that they're, they're tree dwelling, you know, tree actually limited effective quadrupeds, which is quite strange to me. So let's, let's continue. I've said my piece for now. Absolutely. No, no, no. Yeah. And we're going to get his Rasking video going branches here. And climbing trees. Uh, I do want to mention one thing. You went on a lot of stuff there and me as, uh, not being a scientist or involved in this field, I would have to replay this, right? And actually investigate some of the things you're saying because you're covering a lot. I want our audience to bear. You can always watch us again, pause it, take a deep dive. But the one question I have is you haven't once responded to his claim that this is all just a political motivation. You're spitting facts. You're dealing with the data. You're dealing with the, the uh, you're dealing with the fossils. You're dealing with what's going on right in front of our eyes. Why haven't you spent any time addressing the political statements there, Erica? Oh, it, 
But clearly, this is because I'm a part of an international cabal of anthropologists trying to push Afrocentric Marxism on the public, which is absolutely hysterical. Because, you know, it, it, Derek, ask, go ahead, ask me, who was the first person to propose that humans evolved in Africa? Do you happen to know? Who? It's Charles Darwin in The Descent of Man. So it's not like this is a new idea. Out of Africa is not something that came about because of political motivations. This is something that Darwin comes up with when like abolitionists were still around and needing to be a thing because slavery was still bopping around here and there, <laughs> right? This is 1800 stuff. Right. So I think that it's it's really convenient that Robert feels he can just kind of blame it on, blame it on I guess, the, the, the woke anthropology community. It's like, does he not know the history of the anthropology community? It's got like some of the most racist stuff in its past as any field dealing with humans would. Uh, granted, it's mostly like, you know, cultural and really early biological, but still. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue. While Lovejoy claimed that Lucy, which was dated to 3.4 million years ago, was at least partially bipedal, he proposes that Artie, another alleged human ancestor dated to between 4 and 5 million years ago, spent more of its time allegedly walking than Lucy, despite being over a million years older. Okay, this pause. article titled... That's just blatantly incorrect. Like, Lovejoy would not propose that Artipithecus, that first hominin that I showed you with the toe that sticks out to the side like this, mm -hmm. which came, and it's not a million years, mind you, but it's about 700,000 years, that it was more bipedal than Lucy. No one thinks that, and I can back that up with the glut of sources that I've got sitting just off to the side in another tab, ready to send to Derek to pin this in the description. Because I like to come with sources. That's that's something that I think is good practice for everyone to do. But I would challenge anyone here to, to show me where Owen Lovejoy has said that Artipithecus comes before Australopithecus and that Artipithecus is more of a biped than Australopithecus. I just don't think that he can show it because I that's just not a position Lovejoy holds. Thank you. Man did not evolve from apes, says. A U.S. biological anthropologist says he's determined humans did not evolve from apes, but rather apes evolved from humans. Kent State University professor C. Owen Lovejoy, who specializes in the study of human origins, said his findings came from a study of Artipithecus ramidus, a hominid species that lived 4.4 million years ago in what is now Ethiopia. Quote, People often think we evolved from apes, but no, apes many ways evolved from us, Lovejoy said. Pause. Been a okay, really quick. Like, and actually we share that screen again because I want to I want to yeah. motion at some stuff that's on there. Okay. So notice it says study, man did not evolve from apes. And then it says a US biological anthropologist says he's determined that to prove, I guess, that humans didn't evolve from apes, but rather apes evolved from humans. So first and foremost. Note that that's not in quotes because Owen Lovejoy understands that humans are currently apes. We are members of the family Hominidae, which is the ape family. And then you have to go all the way down both to like that area that's cut off where he finally actually get they get a quote from this guy where he says, you know, people often think we evolved from apes, but no, in many ways, apes, and he's using this colloquially to refer to other extant great apes, evolved from humans. And what he means when he's saying that, as referenced by literally the entire body of Owen Lovejoy's work, of which I have read most, if not all of, for the class I'm currently taking on hominin evolution, given he's so involved in two of these really early members of our lineage. What he's saying is that Artipithecus raminus has in many ways more similarities than the modern with the modern human body plan than it does with knuckle walking chimpanzees or gorillas, because those guys are quadrupedal and they walk on their knuckles. Both of them do. Humans are bipedal with an upright stance. Artipithecus was probably hanging out in the trees sometimes with an upright stance, and when it came from the ground, it's still to the ground, excuse me, it still had that upright stance, as referenced again, or as I guess supported again, by that entire suite of characteristics that's necessary. Uh, or that rather that if you have them, you are necessarily a biped. So what Lovejoy is saying is that it may be that humans are actually less divergent from the common ancestor that we share with chimps than chimps are. This is not helpful to what Robert's point is going to be, which is that humans share no relation with the rest of the apes. Mm. Want me to continue? Yeah. All right. Popular idea to think humans are modified chimpanzees. From studying Artipithecus ramidus, or Arti, a partial female skeleton, we learned that we cannot understand or model human evolution from chimps or gorillas. Of course, Lovejoy is still very much in the mainstream, 
and Wally proposes that humans and apes shared a common ancestor that was neither human or monkey, at least he makes it clear that the popular idea that humans are modified chimps is false. My own analysis Quick is that- pause. Quick pause there. Uh, I want to give him credit where credit is due. Yes, Lovejoy has said in many of his, in many of his sort of uh, uh, conventional works, all his work is conventional, but published works. Yeah, chimpanzees probably aren't the best model for the last common ancestor between humans and chimps. And the reason is because both humans and modern chimps have been evolving for 7 million years. So it's unlikely that either one of us represents a perfect model for something we both diverged from 7 million years ago. So yeah, he's he's totally correct. Of course, it, it is kind of weird that, that Lovejoy has published work comparing Ardipithecus to chimpanzees and then to humans to show you know, where Artie falls on this uh, after he just said that it's not a good idea to compare us to chimps, but I digress. That's kind of a dig more on, on that strategy by Lovejoy and Tim White than anything else. Now he's going to tell us, Robert is about to tell us uh, why, and the quote that he just said, we kind of cut him off a little bit, is from my back, own research. back it up a little. Yeah, let's, let's, do, let's do it. Let's back it up a little bit. Okay. Or monkey, at least he makes it clear that the popular idea that humans are modified chimps is false. My own analysis is that neither Lucy or Artie, which were a little over three feet tall, walked upright at all, and were both primarily tree dwellers, not only because their feet resembled hands like other apes, but because their furry ape-like bodies did not sweat the way all bipedal hominins do, as sweating is a trait that is associated with running and hunting, which neither okay, of these species. Okay, so uh, a couple of quick things. Thank you, Robert, for your analysis on why these two hominins are not tree dwellers. But given that you, you mixed them up, forgive me if I'm a bit wary of, of your personal analysis, right? I mean, this is an edited video, so there were plenty of opportunities to fix that slip up or re-record earlier when he called, you know, an, an Australopithecine Ardipithecus, or rather, he called Ardipithecus's feet an Australopithecine foot. Now, if you will remember, Right, these hominins are bipedal when they're on the ground. They're they're biomechanically necessarily bipedal when they're on the ground. So to say that bipedal hominins sweat, therefore these guys aren't bipedal hominins is is kind of silly because part of being a hominin is being bipedal. That's that's part of the criteria. It's that and a reduction in canine tooth size that first starts to kind of move us in into the hominin direction. Secondly, secondarily speaking, I guess I, I should say. Um, what do you mean they don't sweat? <laughs> Other apes sweat, right? They're just not efficient sweaters, right? We are really, really good at sweating and thermoregulating when we run. But at least according to the molecular clock, hair was beginning to thin out around the time that Australopithecines were around. Now it's not going to be anything naked looking like, like humans until like really after Homo erectus. And boy, isn't that strange? Because what Robert is going to say later is that Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis and you know, uh, Homo georgicus, ergaster, erectus, and onward and upwards are all a part of the human family tree. They're all fine. Those things are hominids and interbred with this mysterious Atlantean race that lived on the Canary Island. <laughs> That's all fine and dandy, but the, the reasons that you're saying Australopithecus afarensis can't be a, a human ancestor also apply to Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, and indeed, likely, some of the more archaic members of Homo erectus. This is this is what we know from genetics, right? Taking the molecular clock back and looking at where hairlessness or the, the genes for being more hairless come from, the efficiency in sweating, right? We have the same amount of hair as chimpanzees do. It's just really fine on our bodies, but we have three times the eccrine glands for sweating. So, we can track this kind of thing genetically and see roughly when these things may have come about. And what that suggests, at least to most anthropologists, is that there is not like a cert cutoff line that happens when genus homo begins. This stuff is well in motion, which is what makes it difficult to draw a line and say, no, 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 no. Australopithecines, they're not part of the club because they didn't sweat. <laughs> yes, they you, did. Could, could you see how 90% of an audience would fall? I mean, just right into like accepting that as a statement of fact without knowing yeah. you see what i'm saying oh yeah 100 percent. well that's why you know at the beginning i was like yeah this is a 10 minute video we're gonna, we're gonna take a hot minute with it because every sentence requires dissection um now you know you can probably take my sentences sentences that i say and find wrong things in them over the course of my career on youtube everybody makes mistakes this is true uh but i'm not trying to overturn the paradigm of, of human evolution or the foundations of biology you can't afford to do 
basic graduate level, or excuse me, undergraduate level slip ups when you're trying to be the most dangerous anthropologist. That just can't happen. Yeah. And it makes me kind of wonder back to the motive thing when you're dishing the motivation of acting like this is woke anthropology or the cabal of uh, politically correct uh, scientists that are involved in this. It makes you kind of wonder with the conclusions he's drawing and building this case up. What are his actual motives? What is he really trying to say? Is he trying to make a, a certain race better? I mean, I really kind of wonder these things. Uh is he trying to say that, hey, us humans didn't come from the same breed as other people from other ethnicities? Is that saying that one is superior than the other, et cetera? What is the point? I mean, it, you kind of have to ask those questions. So, all right, let's continue. Let, stop me anytime. I don't care if it's 10 seconds from now. We are almost halfway through the video. So, did. The artistic reconstructions in museums are deceptive, showing erect, upright models with human-like feet, which is a fraud. And while they're not completely fake specimen like the Piltdown Man, which was a baboon's jaw glued onto a human skull and touted as the missing link by the British Museum for almost oh. 50 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so go ahead and share my screen if you would please, Derek. Absolutely. So this individual that we've got here, again, we've already seen this guy. This is STW573, um, I believe. And let me hide that there. I hope you guys, can you see the foot on this thing down here? Barely. Barely. I mean, we can see it, but we can't like examine it up close. Yeah, that's okay. I got another better picture to show you for that. Oops. We're going to get to that later. Um, this was, this is an Australopithecine. This is Australopithecus africanus, uh, STW573, known as Littlefoot. And the reason it's known as Littlefoot is because it's got a foot. Um, down there at the bottom, and I, I think I'll switch over and like Google a pretty good picture in a second to show it a little bit better. This thing's remarkably complete, so it's not like the foot is like fraudulent. It can articulate with the distal end of that tibia and with those those metatarsals down there. But the toes, the phalanges and the metatarsals that come off of this, um, the tarsals and the metatarsals uh, that come off of this foot are straight and in line, right? The feet aren't fake. They're they're perfectly they're perfectly representative of everything that we've ever found. Another one that we've got is this one. This is a better picture. So you can see uh, a comparison of Morton in 1935. He imagined what the progression from a more primitive ape-like foot would look like as it moves to the human form. Now, Artipithecus raminus, that one we talked about that he goofed up with that divergent big toe, is right there. It's pretty obvious. And then Morton imagined that a transition between something with a divergent grasping toe would look like that thing that's a, a drawing that says Morton's 1935 pre-human mm -hmm. foot. STW575, Australopithecus africanus, is to the right of that. This thing had inline toes, right? Just like a just like a human does. Right. And dated to the same time period are the Laetoli footprints, right? And you, everybody knows the Laetoli footprints. It's a trackway of footprints that are significantly smaller than human, than modern human feet, right? But they are displaying a morphology of something that has three arches in the foot, just like modern humans do, and an inline toe just like Australopithecines did. And it's dated to the time period that Australopithecus afarensis was in the area. So not only do we have evidence that their morphology of the feet, you know, suggests something that's bipedal and walking with an inline toe and three arches, but we also have the footprints made by these creatures and they show that they're bipedal. There are no knuckle marks on the Laetoli footprints. But we got even better because we've also got the Dakika child's foot, another one with inline toes. Wow, shocking. The feet aren't fake, right? saying that they're fake is and then comparing them to piltdown man of all things when we have so much fossil material we have metacarpals carol ward reported on uh metacarpals excuse me metatarsals and tarsals that carol ward has reported on i met carol ward at the aabas this year right a, a metatarsal for um those of you who are wondering is like the the toe bones that are before your your actual toes that stick out uh they would be these right here and they're curved because they have arches, right? Um, so, you know, to say that they're fake is, is silly and displays to me someone who, like, literally hasn't looked at the fossil record. That's the part that's so concerning. Because all you have to do is Google Australopithecine foot, and this stuff all comes up, raring and ready for you to see. Like, can you imagine a, an anthropologist in the field ever drawing the conclusions that he's drawing? Never. And no one ever has. This From the moment Lucy was discovered, it was of absolute no argument that this thing was bipedal when it was on the ground. The argument with Lucy was always whether or not it still spent any time at all in the trees. And the reason is because, and the reason it's become more solidified since then is because, again, 
we have more australopithecine material than we know what to do with. We have like over half a dozen species in the genus Australopithecus, comprising over 300 individuals made up of thousands of specimens, many of them carpals, metacarpals, tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges, and, you know, knees, and pelvis, and bottoms of skulls with the occipital holding the front. We know these things were bipeds. This is, this is of no debate. Um, even, like, it, you will rarely find good arguments coming from anybody who's trying to, to, to say that these things weren't bipedal on the ground, but it, then it gets worse because he starts talking about the Piltdown Man, and he gets the Piltdown Man combination wrong. He says that it's a human skull with a baboon's jaw. It was an orangutan's jaw with chimpanzee teeth, right? The Piltdown specimen is something that you learn in like a 101 class because it's the most famous hoax in paleoanthropology of all time. And it's just worrying to me that this is an edited video and and he's getting that much wrong. I mean, he didn't even get in the right family, right? Baboons are circopithecids, we're hominids. Mm. No one would buy, a, a baboon's jaw is too small, wouldn't even fit. So. Anyways, I, I'm just, this riles me up a lot because it, it feels, and I know I'm getting sassy with Robert and like, Robert, I'm, I'm sorry, like, but if you're calling yourself an anthropologist, you should probably make sure that you're doing the work to, to be deserving of that label, if that makes sense. Like, just do the footwork, haha, and like, look up pictures of australopithecine feet before you say that they're fake. Thank you. All right, I'll continue. Or the Nebraska man which was another imaginary creation based on what turned out to be a pig's tooth. The missing link is still very much missing, and the linear hominin progression proposed by the out-of-Africa model continues to fall apart as advances are made in the field of genetics. The obsolete and politically motivated out-of-Africa model proposes a single and relatively recent transition from archaic hominins to anatomically modern humans in Africa, which is okay. not... So, oh boy, there's there's a lot of stuff to, to kind of touch on here. The genetics does not help the case with that, that Robert is trying to propose. And I it was interesting because when I was listening to this video, I was like, I was actually running and Derek knows because I, I texted him right after and I was like, oh my God, you gotta talk about it. But yeah, I'm I'm listening. I was like, I was panting. I was like, oh my God. But I'm I'm like listening to this and I'm thinking, surely he's he can't possibly touch on the genetics. Right, because I, there isn't a single study out there that that is contra to out of Africa past like 2002, you know, after the human genome was sequenced in 2001, because it became so difficult um, to to have a leg to stand on. It's easy when you're looking at sections of, of the genome because you know, genetics is weird, and I'm not a geneticist, so you know, my background is more in morphology. But that being said, I know enough about genetics to explain out of Africa because it's a pretty basic concept. And we're going to talk about a couple different, you saw the, in my pictures, I've got a couple of nice figures to show you from four distinct papers, uh, which are bolstered or are bolstering out of Africa using four distinct lines of genetic evidence specifically. So we're going to see how he kind of makes his case. He starts immediately by talking about this ghost lineage, right? And he talks about how humans emerge relatively recently. You know, I'm always asking like, why aren't we defining our terms? And I ask, well, well, we'll we'll get to that. Let's just keep going because he's going to okay. say a lot of stuff, and I kind of want to tackle it all at once. Okay, awesome. Supported by the fossil record, followed by a later migration to the rest of the world, replacing other still existing hominin populations, which again is not what happened. DNA sequencing of modern and archaic genomes has now conclusively and irrefutably demonstrated that humanity is a hybrid species, and that racial differentiation exists because we're comprised of various degrees of different hominid species which interbred within the past 50,000 years. In okay. Uh, that's a red flag. I, I yeah. caught that, and I don't know jack squat compared to you on anything. Oh, boy. Okay, yeah. So, all right. Um, a little important background information. So humans, as in Homo sapiens, and we're going to talk about the support for this again from both the paleontologic record and the genetic work here in a second, but... Humans evolved in Africa. Homo sapiens, the species, evolved in Africa, right? This was 300,000 years ago, and it was happening in multiple, like, you know, in, in sort of a contiguous area along, you know, the North, North African area all the way to East Africa is where we, you know, first find these Homo sapiens remains that can be definitively clocked as Homo sapiens and not something else. Humans, as in, when, when, you know, for, for clarity's sake, when I say humans, I'm referring to Homo sapiens, the mm -hmm. species. 
Humans were not the first hominin to leave Africa, not by a long shot. Homo erectus left far earlier and spread across the entire globe, and they lasted a long freaking time. Homo erectus, depending on what you consider Homo erectus, is like a two million year old species, and it didn't go extinct until like 100,000 years ago. It made it all across the globe, and depending on whether or not you accept Homo heidelbergensis, it's just a naming game, whether or not the uh, species between erectus and Neanderthals, because Neanderthals descend from Homo erectus. Some people call that the uh, specimens that bridge that gap Homo heidelbergensis. Eh, it's a little bit of a waste basket tax on, but I digress. Neanderthals evolve in Eurasia. Denisovans, another hominin that's pretty enigmatic, evolves in sort of West, or excuse me, Eastern Asia. We get Homo floresiensis, these three foot tall hobbit hominins that evolve in Flores. Homo luzonensis, another hobbit hominin, is like one, so one island over from these guys. And in the south, Homo naledi, a very ape-looking hominin, apish hominin with like a really small brain case and very like apish arms for um, still maneuvering potentially in the trees, depending on if you listen to Lee Berger or not, uh, living, all these guys are living contemporaneously around 250,000 years ago, which is fascinating to think about. But the way that he's representing it is that Homo sapiens is this mishmash combination of a bunch of these different hominids. This is not the case. Homo sapiens evolved in Africa and spread out and did interbreed with many of them, but it's not looking like they interbred enough to become like a 50-50 hybrid. You can find some European people today with up to 4% of their DNA, that 4% is a maximum, being Neanderthal in nature. Clearly, clearly, excuse me, the Homo sapiens DNA won out as far as natural selection went. In fact, you can link some pathologies to having certain Neanderthal genes, probably because they were really inbred populations by the time humans reached them around 44,000 years ago or earlier. Um, Denisovans, Southeast Asian people can have up to 12% Denisovans DNA in their genome, but it doesn't get past that 17%. And what he's about to talk here, or what he mentioned previously and is going to potentially elaborate on, I can't remember if he, if he elaborates on it or not, is this strange ghost lineage that interbred with individuals, Homo sapiens individuals who were still living in Africa. And this ghost lineage can add from two to, I think it's 17 or even 19% of individuals who are living in sort of this North, or not North African, like Sub-Saharan Africa DNA. So it's, and he uses that in a way that feels very, very dicey. When he talks about this ghost lineage adding to these African individuals, it's almost like he's saying it like they have more primitive to them than other groups of people do. Completely unaware of, I guess, the levels of interbreeding that happened with more I'm just going to say it with white people who are like going up into Europe and interbreeding with Neanderthals or Asian folks who are interbreeding with Denisovans. Pretty much every human group interbred with some kind of archaic hominin that came earlier because we're humans and we were interacting with people that looked like us but weren't us but could exchange some genes. That's what humans do. We've done it since the dawn of time. This is why cultural exchange tends to involve genetic exchange too when you track it through time. Um, there is nothing about African groups that makes them more archaic. And it's kind of obscene to imply that that is the case. I'm gonna back this up with genetic work uh, here in a little bit, um, some of the work that's that's been done on it, but it, it should be a big red flag that he isn't treating all these archaic admixtures equally. Okay. Did that all make sense, Derek? Or yeah, was that I, I, I'm tracking what you're saying here. There's a lot of detail here that, that needs to get into because I keep thinking about the islands he's going to get into and the yeah. some highlights that we're going to be touching on. So, yeah. In this article published in Nature, we read that ancient humans lived in a Lord of the Rings world and indulged in interspecies sex, including Neanderthals, Denisovans, and a mystery species, which anthropologists have labeled a ghost species, meaning it's considered super archaic, not yet identified in the fossil record, but likely Homo erectus or Homo habilis, over 1 million years removed from modern hominins, and comprises up to 19% of sub-Saharan African DNA, not found in the DNA of Asians or Caucasians. Pause. This okay, so you see what he's done there, that characterization, mm -hmm. right? So that should be worrisome. He doesn't say 2 to 19%, which is the amount of DNA that can be assigned to this 
uh, archaic hominin species that lived in Africa. He says up to 19%, which is to imply that this, and he says super archaic to kind of potentially, and this is my read. So Robert, if I'm reading you wrong, let me know, because I'm not trying to mischaracterize you, but this is this is my read of the situation. It seems to me like it's being characterized that some humans interbred with Neanderthals, yay, that's fine. Some humans interbred with Denisovans, awesome, that's cool. But these these this sub-Saharan African group interbred with a super archaic hominin that is much more primitive than the hominins that other people groups interbred with. And they're not with. found in Caucasians, and they're not found in right, right. Bingo! Yeah, that's a gigantic red flag. So what I did is I pulled up the um I pulled up the paper. Uh, and I just want to take a look at this abstract here. Let me find what I'm looking for. Um, you don't find, let me just control F here. Just go. Yeah, I control F for super. There is no super in the paper that's talking about the archaic admixture. Neanderthals are archaic. Denisovans are archaic, which means whatever these African individuals were interbreeding with isn't more archaic, it's just archaic. And all that's meaning is that it's a hominin that emerged earlier than Homo sapiens just like Neanderthals did, just like Denise Evans did. Uh, but but the way that he's characterized it, and you, you notice he even said like Homo erectus or Homo habilis. And that's pretty bonkers because Homo habilis is from 2.4 million years ago. And Neanderthals emerged maybe as old as 800,000. So he's implying pretty heavily, at least as far as I'm concerned, right, that we're looking at a, a bias on how primitive certain people have inter or how yeah how primitive the hominins that certain people groups have interbred with and that the Africans have interbred with what this most primitive group I guess right I I can't see any support for that whatsoever uh, and the fact that it's being characterized like that suggests to me that perhaps Robert did not read the paper that he is citing I kind of wonder too. It you know, it seems that Robert reads a lot of old stuff, um, Madame Blavatsky and all these kind of spiritualist and things. I also wonder if he studied ancient or I call it ancient centuries old anthropologist. And like you said, we've had a dirty, dark history in anthropology that actually showing racist uh, ideologies and whatnot, Nazi Germany, etc. I wonder if He's come, ac come across someone who's made these statements before. It'd be interested to investigate and find out. I know you haven't read them. You, you're not like opening these <laughs> books and going, I can't wait to learn from this guy who's trying to say certain racial ethnic groups are uh, far more primitive and aren't even related to us in many respects. Like, come on, you know, so. It's, it's concerning. I mean, the multi-regional hypothesis, which is this idea that each race, the, the primitive, the big, I mean, see, I'm like using like the terminology from bioanth. The early versions of the multi-regional hypothesis were like, yeah, the races of humans have different kind of parent hominins that they descend from. Genetics annihilated this. Humans today are very, very non-diverse in our genetics compared to other animals, right? We are all like 99.9% .9 similar to each other. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that's the actual number that tends to be put forward. Um, and boy, that diversity... Again, we're gonna we're gonna talk goodness, about how that, your political mumbo jumbo there, Erica. Yeah, that, yeah goodness. <laughs> yeah, me and my uh, me and my Marxism talking about bones. But uh, uh, okay, let's let's let them continue because okay. yeah, let's let's continue on. Oh, sorry, it's the wrong one. Here we go. Breeding event happened about forty three thousand years ago in Africa. In other words, it's not possible for sub-Saharan Africans that contain this archaic DNA that is absent in Cro-Magnon to have left Africa thirty five thousand years ago and magically mutated into what became modern day Europeans or Caucasians or Asians. So this pops. Yeah, I already okay. knew. <laughs> massive, massive flub up here. Okay, huge. This is gigantically problematic with that anthropologist label attached. So out of Africa occurred from 50,000 years ago to 70,000 years ago, which would mean, and let's, let's, will you back it up a minute? Cause I want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, say yeah. Let me, let me do it before. again here. I'm going to back it up. We're at 603. Let's go to, let's go to about right here. Yeah. Pay close, pay close attention to the numbers. Okay. Interbreeding event happened about 43,000 years ago in Africa. In other words, it's not possible for sub-Saharan Africans that contain this archaic DNA that is absent in Cro-Magnon to have left Africa 35,000 years ago and magically mutated into what became modern day Europeans or Caucasians or Asians.
Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Humans 35,000 to 43,000 years is the... Yep. So he's, so he's saying that humans are supposed to have left Africa 35,000 years ago. Eh, wrong. You're like, you just should go and double that number. That's when humans initially left Africa. And then he's saying, so sub-Saharan Africans can't possibly be, you know, this, this founding population for the rest of Homo sapiens because the interbreeding event with this archaic Homo sapiens or archaic hominin that's around happened 43,000 years ago. So he's saying the interbreeding happened before humans left Africa. So if we all left from Africa, everyone should have traces of this archaic hominin in their genome. The problem is he has the freaking date wrong. Humans left Africa between 50 and 70,000 years ago, well before this interbreeding event happened. And not every human left Africa. So the ones that stayed did interbreed with whatever this hominin was. And the ones that left just interbreed with other ones, just interbred with other ones, right? You got to know these numbers, man. Like if you don't know these, you can't expect to overturn conventional anthropology if you're not even arguing with what conventional anthropologists are actually saying. And, you know, people might say, well, actually, those out of Africa numbers might not be, you know, those are taken from genetics and maybe their molecular clocks are wrong. Nope, because we also have fossil evidence for when humans actually leave Africa, because it turns out when humans die, we tend to bury our dead places. So we can actually plot through genetics, but also through, you know, uh, human remains being left behind, the paths that humans took as they left Africa, right? This is, this is not hard to find stuff. All right. <laughs> it's <keep> frustrating. <laughs> so this leaves the question, where did Cro-Magnon or modern Europeans come from? When we look up the word indigenous in the dictionary, it says, quote, originating or occurring naturally in a particular place, native. That said, the islands right off of the coast of Africa are known as the Canary Islands, and the native indigenous inhabitants were known as Guanches. They left behind tall, blonde, and red-headed mummies and were studied extensively by the National Socialists of the 30s and 40s. Okay. I, That's just a hell of a sentence, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Like, just, why is that even, you know, why? You know, anyway, but go ahead. For No, I mean, for me, it's so... I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to like say they're th that group of people's name because I don't want to like demonetize you. Like, are we allowed to say that word here? I mean, the National Socialist Party. Can I say that? I don't want to demonetize you. I don't think the, it would. I think we'd be fine if you said the, that. The Nazis, I guess. I should, okay, Nazis, whatever. We'll just say it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the, the, the anthropological work that the Nazis did is not known for its like robusticity, right? It's just, it's just not known for being very good. Uh, and you, you might ask. Tell me their bias towards like. <laughs> white people well, like yeah I, I mean yeah you you might say boy howdy why might that be uh why is their work so poor well and it, it might just be because we were starting to catch little whiffs of you know humans having evolved in africa when they were doing their whole world war ii thing and before that eugene dubois had found remains of what he was at the time calling pithecanthropus but it's homo erectus in java and they didn't really like that too much, the Nazis, because that would perhaps imply that humans did not evolve in Europe, which is where everyone thought they should have evolved. And that's why the Piltdown fake was found in the UK. <laughs> so it's like, because of course it was, uh, mm -hmm. in order to support these, these ideas. I mean, there's a long and sordid past of people uh, faking artifacts and also paleontologic finds. But boy, how curious is it that all of those faked finds seem to support this European-centric human evolution, while the ones that have stood the test of time and since accrued thousands of more specimens at dozens of field sites, uh, they just kind of keep on bopping around, keep on coming back. And then, the, oh, that pesky genetics comes by and starts telling us about the L0 haplogroup. And where do we find it? The oldest haplogroup that everyone converges on? Sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, that's problematic. We're going to have to talk about that genetics here in a minute. But I think we're going to have to talk about it after we talk about the Guanchins and their red, blonde-haired mummies and Cro-Magnon man. So let's let him tell us about all of that. <laughs> I love your energy. I really do. Seriously. All right. Let me back this up a little bit because this is like the fun part of the show. All right. Here we this go. Is, this is the goofball. He. This is where Robert enters into the goofball zone. It's yeah. pretty Get bonkers. ready for Atlantis and all of that interesting stuff. Here we go. Truly in a particular place. Native. That said, 
the islands right off of the coast of Africa are known as the Canary Islands, and the native indigenous inhabitants were known as Guanches. They left behind tall blonde and red-headed mummies and were studied extensively by the National Socialists of the 30s and 40s. If we look up By the way, did you find out if there were really any blonde or red-headed mummies found on that island? Oh, yeah. No, I, well, okay, so it's dicey, right? Uh, some of the mummies that are found there do have blonde or red hair, mm -hmm. just like North African Berber descendants do. Right. Right. So it turns out, like, you know, again, and I keep saying this, what a strange coincidence that a group of an island chain very close to a group of kind of southern, southernmost Europeans who represent blonde hair and red hair and like paler skin managed to make it to a an island chain that's on their latitude and then stay there and do mummies, right? Like, wow, shocking. It's almost like people sometimes go to islands or disperse and go other Are places. Are you kidding? Yeah, ah, what? But you know, guess what? Those, those guanches, they also have African DNA as well. Um, mm. And non uh, northern African DNA that isn't tied to like these these European links. Um, M haplotype. I, I've got I've got my papers in the background okay. here. So next time we let we'll it go. To, yeah, and if if we ever do a follow up too, I do want to mention. Um, I've interviewed Ralph Ellis in the past, and it's really ironic. He is in Europe somewhere, and I wonder if he has these same French old ideas, and that there's this. He might be like buddy buddy with people like Robert. Maybe they're enemies because you know birds of a feather they get too close together become enemies often um but he always makes these cases to try and prove that like the egyptian pharaohs were all caucasians with red hair uh because they found some mummies with red hair um you know everybody is like jesus is uh, a descendant of julius caesar and cleopatra like conspiracy theories to oh, make so jesus white. yeah to make jesus oh, white and jesus is another symbol for king arthur like like the levels at which the conspiracy goes to postulate like, well, really whites were the ones who ruled that empire. Whites ruled that empire. every single thing becomes kind of, well, my color, it must've been me, you know, and, and projected God. it into the ancient world. God. And the funniest thing about this too is like skin color is like the most plastic trait out there. Skin color changes so quickly when we're looking at population level shifts, which is why skin color has actually evolved independently in different parts of the world, both in the lighter direction as populations move northward and need to absorb more vitamin D, and in the opposite direction. Skin color has gotten darker as populations have moved into more equatorial regions because it's a freaking adaptive trait to keep you from getting either too much radiation or not enough vitamin D, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and this is all available online. You can just find this stuff out. A lot of these papers are public access and there's other ways to find them too if you're not gonna look at the public access route. You can email authors and ask them to see it. There's no excuse in the modern era to be you know, ignorant of this kind of stuff. And again, mm -hmm. He's the most dangerous anthropologist. Why doesn't he know this if he's got that anthropology degree? Um, he's the one that said it, right? Biological anthropology involves genetics, and it also involves fossils, and he's getting them both wrong. Uh, so, and that's, you know, that kind of ties into the, the blonde-haired and red-haired mummies. Yeah, there probably are light-haired mummies on the, island, the Canary Islands, right? I didn't find anything on it on first glance. In fact, I found conflicting information when I looked into it. Some people said that they were more darker skinned. Some people said that they were more lighter skinned. It doesn't matter, mm -hmm. quite frankly, whether they were dark skinned or light skinned because none of this has any impact on out of Africa. What, the argument that he's going to make is that like, oh, wow, of course, people have different skin colors in different parts of the world and different hair colors in different parts of the world. You mentioned Egypt earlier, the old kingdom of Egypt. There's no denying that these individuals were super dark skinned, right? That we know this, we, we have the genetics of a lot of them um, and we've looked at mummies, etc. The lighter skinned Egyptians were when the Ptolemaic period came around and the Greeks were occupying Egypt. Shocker, they're from the North where, yeah. where the skin is lighter. It's almost like you can track these things uh, and it's not some gigantic Atlantean level conspiracy where, you know, the, oh God, we're, I'm sure, let's just let them continue. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm going to do okay. the genetics when we get more towards the end. Awesome. The Guanches in Encyclopedia Britannica, it says that they were the direct descendants of Cro-Magnon, which makes sense as the museum on the Canary Islands has the largest collection of Cro-Magnon skulls anywhere in the world. 
It also says that they had blue or gray eyes and blonde hair, which also makes sense, since the mummies that they left behind had blonde and red hair. It also links them to populations in Europe and North Africa, and not only do the Guanches share genetic affinities with the Basque and the Berbers, which are the natives of North Africa, all of these populations are among the highest percentage of Rh negative blood factor in the world. That said, the Basque mythology, which according to the Center for Basque Studies at the University of Nevada, says, quote, Where did the Basque come from? No one knows exactly where the Basque came from. Some say they have lived in that area since Cro-Magnon man first roamed Europe. Estimates of how long they have lived there vary from 10,000 to 75,000 years. Some say they were descended from the original Iberians. More fanciful theories exist as well. One is that the Basque are the descendants of the survivors of Atlantis. All right, that's a good that's that's a good spot to kind of pause for a second. Uh, so those are, some of you might be wondering, like, what does Cro-Magnon mean? Because he keeps bringing it up. Cro-Magnon is just like a colloquial term that we use to refer to like early European Homo sapiens, right? So it's it's Homo sapiens, archaic and middle, and even dipping into the more you know uh, derived Homo sapiens, anatomically modern, you might say. Uh, that, that lived in Europe. That's it. That's what Cro-Magnon means. So all of the things that he said, and again, I, I could not find a confirmation that the, the Gaunt, uh, what is it, Guanches? Yeah, the Guanches, that these individuals that lived on the Canary Island, that they were definitively characterized by significantly light skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, or red hair. We can just say that's all true, though. We can just go ahead and give that to him. None of that changes the fact that the out of Africa model states that humans left Africa 50 to 70,000 years ago, went up into Europe on one side, the N haplotype group, and all the way on the, the sort of southward and up into Asia Trail on the other side, right? Coming out of the, the Middle East, if you will. All of that can happen. And then you can have a group of Europeans come back down to the Canary Islands in North Africa. In fact, there's even there's even a word for it called back to Africa bec because genetically speaking, we find admixture of populations that went north, interbred with Neanderthals, and then gave some of those genes to North African populations. All of this is plotted. And the cool part about it is we know the relative time periods that this happened to. So none of what he said is indicative of something that is some kind of blow to out of Africa. It, it simply isn't. Um, but that also being said, like, I couldn't find anything on, like, the Cro-Magnon skulls being most common in the Canary Islands, like, the biggest collection. I couldn't find anything on that. Uh, that could be the case. Maybe it is. But, uh, you know, again, like, what he's saying here is he's he's constructing a counter-narrative out of Africa without having actually taken out of Africa down. What about the RH uh, argument he was bringing oh. up? Uh Oh, God. Yeah, the RH factor. So when he first said that, oh, my God, Derek, when he first said that, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird. Like, why Why is the RH factor being brought up? That seems like such a random thing. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that there is actually, and I, I want to get the phrasing exactly right here. So I'm, I'm trying to- Do I to need to share out. the screen? No, no, no. Don't share okay. the screen yet. Okay. Because I got to- Okay. It is a common theory that I found this phrasing on on the this was the uh, the blog that I was telling you about of the guy who says he went to the same school as Robert and that he couldn't find any evidence that he graduated from that school. Robert, that's not me saying that. I read it somewhere else. Just FYI, I don't know if that's true and maybe it's not true. But apparently, Rh negative blood factors, um, which are really common among the Basque people, which he just said, and South and like generally speaking, Southern European groups that they're associated with like Atlanteans and aliens, which is something that is just kind of mind blowing because like, what, what are the implications there? That if you have the RH factor, you are what closer to this alien hybrid race? I thought they were Atlanteans. Wh which one is it? Are we talking about Atlantis? Are we talking about aliens? Did aliens yeah. seed Atlantis with super people who were tall with <laughs> blonde hair that's also red? <laughs> and gray blue eyes by the way just so you know and we're gonna you'll be able to see the chat later there are people who have already said like the one thing robert isn't just saying is that aliens came down and actually like mated or genetically modified i don't know what his position oh, would be, but he really thinks maybe something is like going on with extraterrestrials and hominids to create a special race which would fit 
once again into this idea, Caucasians and Asians, etc. But there's this old, old, uh, you know, uh, version that, you know, we're not connected to that primitive. You, know, you kind of have to wonder what kind of mishmash ideas is going on here. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, the vibe that I was getting is that um, they're, <laughs> oh God, I, I, it like hurts me to even say this because it's just vile, honestly. But the, the idea that I seem to be picking up on, and again, I could be wrong. So let me know if I'm wrong, Robert. I don't want to mischaracterize you. This is just my read. The vibe that I'm getting is that there is some kind of super race of, of human, right? Mm -hmm. That whose DNA is more prevalent in like Caucasians and Asian people than folks who live in Africa, except for the North Africans, because those are the white ones. <laughs> right. If you got and red hair, like, blue eyes, you yeah, know, blonde hair. And you just kind of have to go like, okay, what are we trying to say here, really? Because, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it since I'm the, the Afrocentric uh, Marxist in the room. It feels like a supremacist thing to me. Right. It feels like it's trying to use uh, admixture with ancient hominins to create some kind of hierarchy of modern human races based off of the ancient hominins that they admixed with. And now everyone who's watched this far 360 people watching live right now, you can understand why we're doing this video as we're speaking. Like, not only are we trying to get just what the facts are out there and have you explain this, it's also like 340,000 people actually, like, like everything he says, they're eating off the plate. This guy's on the right track. Everything he's saying is true. And you have to wonder, I, I mentioned this yesterday to Erica on the phone. I said, I wonder, and I mean, maybe I'm wrong. And if this is, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I will admit it and apologize for being wrong. But if we're right about this, that there is something going on about supremacy in this, in some sense of a superior type of genetic, uh, whatever you'd like to put in a certain people and others are not as superior. Um, if I'm correct, then this would make sense why I'm sitting here talking to you, trying to make these points and say, hey, this is not good. The 340,000 people, most of them didn't go and subscribe to his channel because of these teachings. I guarantee you they went, oh, wow, he's talking about, like me, I subscribed and said, dude, this guy's talking about ancient mythology, some really cool stuff. What is this Atlantis mythology? What is this? There are old ancient stories that are cool. I like checking them out. I like diving into the myths and the stories and all sorts of cultures, but you get sucked into there. And the next thing you know, you're getting fed all this other stuff. And you have to wonder like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is there a filter? Does his audience have a cult mentality that whatever he says is right. And they're teaching that to their families and everyone else out there and looking at other people who aren't Asian or Caucasian and saying, yeah, you weren't, uh, my alien ancestor gave me something you don't have. Like, no. So, I think these might be harmful, and that's why I, I'm doing this. I agree, and what you're saying is true. Because when I was reading up on Robert, because again, I was trying to figure out where you know where's this guy coming from. I wanted to see where he got his degree from. I wanted to see you know if he published anything, which he hasn't. He hasn't published anything. That's not great for an anthropologist. Uh, but I digress. I was looking into it. And I found this interesting paleoanthropology thread on Reddit on the paleoanthropology subreddit. Uh, which is like a dead subreddit, but like one of the top posts was about Robert. And and they were like, what the heck is going on with this guy? I started watching his videos because he was talking about who doesn't love watching videos about Atlantis or ancient aliens. Right. They're, they're funky and interesting and cool. And like far be it for me to say that I'm not an open-minded person. I don't believe in ancient aliens or Atlantis, but both of those things would be really interesting like, and I think that when people are talking about them, it's fun to listen. I mean, right. gosh, I, I, I talked with Jeff Meldrum, the, the foremost authority on Bigfoot on modern day debate. I'm interested. It's cool. Um, but well, that like being the topic said, of giants, like where, yeah, why, are, why are ancient texts talking about giants? Well, they believe there's real fossils that are being hidden by the oh. cabal. You are the cabal. Remember, you're hiding it. Oh, no. no. Yeah. And so it's interesting to hear ancient stories talk about it. Why is the myth of giants prevalent? I'm almost certain Robert falls in the category of thinking they're real actual giants. And I can't imagine him not believing that to be true. I, I well, think he actually believes that. So I, I, I tend to, yeah, I, I tend to agree. And it's really interesting when you look, because young earth creationists do this too. Um, and it's weird that there's I mean, kind of, Bible, so they're forced to, right? So, yeah, 
But yeah, and, and it's weird because these individuals that they want to believe something, whether it's giants or you know Atlantis or whatever. And so they, they kind of put on their, their bias goggles when they're reading stuff. And like, everyone has bias goggles. Yeah. This is true. Everyone has them. I have them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's up to us to do our best to try to take off those goggles when we feel them slipping down onto our head. But it's interesting that they filter a lot of these similarities between ancient cultures. Like, isn't it strange that, wow, younger Christians do it with dragons right so they say every ancient culture has dragons therefore dragons are dinosaurs and dinosaurs lived at the same time as people not 65 million years ago um and clearly robert is doing something quite similar here you know or has with the giant situation where he's saying stuff like every culture has giants in them therefore giants must have been real things and they seem to forget like there's a lot of other similarities between cultures, but no one is going around saying, wow, it sure is weird that every culture seems to have a trickster God or that a lot of cultures seem to have human animal hybrids in their mythos or that a lot of them seem to have, you know, great catastrophes of fire that happen into their past and then saying, therefore, these things were real or must have happened, right? Similarities between cultures may just say something about how humans view the world in general, right? Why do so many cultures have flood myths? And why is it so common that the flood myth stories seem to happen in cultures that live on river sides or by coasts? And right. that landlocked ones don't seem to have these flood myths. It's just interesting to look at these and see what they say about, you know, human nature. And there's a really real, very real question to ask there. I don't think the answer to that question is just going, well, if they're all saying it, it must be legit, Right. Right. Um, but, you know, just so our audience knows, I will be getting to your super chats. We're almost done with the video. I want to say one thing and then keep playing the video if you don't mind. Yeah. On the Giants issue, talking to Ronald Hindle, Hebrew Bible scholar, and he's looked into this. Uh, when a civilization is having to uh, relocate, become nomadic in a sense, because a particular geographical climate changes, causes them to have issues with crops or whatever. So now they're nomadic. They had a civilization, right? Massive stones. They were, they were well off for centuries, maybe even millennia. And then they have to relocate. Then centuries later, descendants of maybe people from other places travel in, they enter these regions and go, how do these stones get put here? When the more advanced, if you will, and I'm not saying advanced, you say that word among the conspiracy minded, they think I mean like technology is a computers, right. etc. No, they were more advanced. They had a bigger society. They were able to develop these walls. So now the mythos is developed. How did these walls get built? Because me and you scratching sticks and stones and, and, and hurtling our sheep and cattle in the middle of the desert we couldn't do that. It must have been advanced gods or giant beings that had the strength to be able to put these stones in these places. They have no explanation. The mythos of giants is created in the imagination because of these things. So there's a lot to study rather than buying the myth literally is true. And and this is why I do what I do. I love to get into this stuff. Yeah. It's well, and to, to add to your point, I'm only saying this because I, I told you earlier that I rushed home to make this on time because I, I'm taking graduate students have to take two courses at the same time that we're teaching, right? So it's six hours, whatever. Uh, and I'm in hominid evolution, like I said, but I'm also taking ancient cities. And one thing that we talked about in ancient cities today uh, was the Easter Island heads, right? Because for years, decades, centuries, people are like, how the hell did they move these giant heads? How did they do it? And then a bunch of college students were like, Let's just see if we take 100 people and make a big cement Easter Island head, if we can walk it by pulling on either end of a big rope to a given spot. And they did it and it worked. So, you know, oftentimes the answer to the question of how did they do these megalithic structures is throw enough people at it and it will happen. If you get enough people under the threat of death, right, or their corvée labor, in the case of Giza, you can make a lot of stuff happen that maybe didn't happen, maybe wouldn't be you know, doable with a smaller group of people. We're talking, you know, kingdoms here in the case of Easter Island or, or any of the Egyptian kingdoms or even in our media periods. Or Stonehenge or, you know. Or Stonehenge, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we so found much. the rollers. We have found the rollers for some, I've been to Stonehenge, right? They've got a great museum there. We know how they, you know, golly, it's impressive what they did, but it's just people, you know, and yeah. I feel like you're almost taking away from human ingenuity when you say that, you know, you have That's to true. have, aliens to do it or some mythic godlike civilization man what if it's just people 
right? People doing people things. We, we want to make a thing. And so we get a bunch of our buddies together or we get a big kingdom and enslave another kingdom. And right. then we, we do it. Um, this has been this human story. It's all we've ever observed. So, you know, I don't know why, why, why appeal to, uh, to aliens. And, you know, I want to say like, I'm, I'm open-minded to the, I do think that there's like life on other planets, whether they have visited here, who's to say, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never seen a UFO, but I would love to see one. You conceded. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've conceded the point. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to think about. All right, I'll move on here. You see where we're at. We're getting close. Let's let's keep going and stop me anytime. Then we'll get to the chat, Q&A, the super chats, and go from there. The concept of Atlantis becomes less fanciful and more probable when one looks at Pleistocene or Ice Age maps of the Atlantic Ocean. When Atlantis was said to have existed and sea levels were much lower or genetic maps of the Pleistocene distribution of DNA on both sides of the Atlantic, such as haplogroup X. But we never hear about these perspectives because the people that control the media and academia in the 21st century are the same people that were promoting the Piltdown Man hoax during the 20th century. I have a lot more to say on the subject, but I'm starting to get hungry and also wanted to visit my favorite goose before I cash in my coupon, who I think is finally starting to warm up to me. Okay, pause. My favorite part of this whole video is actually when he feeds the goose. Like, I, I was actually like, you know what, good for you, Robert. Like, you got this goose to like you, you <laughs> persevered. That's that human ingenuity that I'm talking about. If Robert can go to the same spot every day for like years and get this goose to like him, we can move megalithic structures from one spot to another. I digress. So I want to I wanna talk very briefly. Um, I think we're about... done with the video, by the way. I think it's just... Yeah, right? that's it. That's yeah, it for that's the video. It. Yeah, that's it for the video. But I want to talk about... Because we've been talking about how Robert has not presented evidence to debunk out of Africa from a paleontologic perspective um, or from a genetic perspective. But now I want to present very briefly some support for it, because most of it is like most of the groundbreaking stuff that's really, excuse me, that's really come in favor for out of Africa has been like in the past 10 years. So if you'll go ahead and share my screen for just a moment. Okay. That would be superb. So we've got our pictures here. And the cool, the really cool thing about Out of Africa, and I learned this from my friend Dan and everyone out there, I'm gonna show for Dan for a second. Dan's got an excellent, excellent YouTube channel called Creation Myths, where he takes young earth creationist claims seriously. And he's a he's an evolutionary biology professor. He's got his PhD, he's the real deal. So I got most of these um, figures were recommended to me by one of his videos. So I wanna make sure that I give him full credit. Uh, and I've actually included a link to his YouTube channel in my source description. Uh, but I wanna talk about a couple of these because it turns out you can support Out of Africa by genetics work. Now, if Out of Africa is legitimate, right? There's one simple thing that we kind of have to show to be true, right? All genomes should kind of nest back in to an African genome, right? So this is the first sort of test that we talk about here, which is diversity. The, the first claim of Out of Africa is that if we came from Africa, individuals who are outside of Africa, population should have lower genetic diversity than individuals who are from Africa. And the reason for this is because of the founder effect. If you've ever heard of the mechanisms of evolution, when you've got a big population and the little population schisms off and go does their own thing, within that little population, you get inbreeding. It's just unavoidable because the small population is schismed off and it's less likely for them to encounter other groups uh, until they can kind of grow their population big enough. So if this is the case, ever out of Africa should have lower genetic diversity. This was the prediction that was made. And here was the study that was done all the way back in 2002, which as you can see, subsamples are here on the y-axis and the diversity is here on the x the more diversity you sort of encompass the more diverse the group is and both asians and europeans have lower genetic diversity than individuals who are from africa okay cool so that's one that's one check in favor of out of africa that genetic diversity is higher there than elsewhere but what else can we talk about we could talk about how individuals nest within African uh, groups today. And this was done by the Thousand Genomes Project. It's like a phylogenetic group. And what we're looking here, what we're looking at here uh, specifically is the phylogeny or the nesting pattern of genomes. So just like you can do a phylogenetic tree of all different, say, canines today, all breeds of dogs, and you can nest them backwards by their genomes and see which ones are newer breeds and which ones are older breeds all the way back to a sort of common ancestor, you can do that with human genomes. And we've done it. These hot colors over here, these um, oranges and yellows are African 
genomes. And the ones that are down here, you can see thin, all these areas, these ones come from uh, European and Asian individuals. So once again, there's a huge spike uh, as far as where these nesting patterns occur. And that original haplotype is called the L0 haplotype. And every haplogroup nests within the L0, and the L0 is found in sub-Saharan Africa. So again, this is um, a thousand genomes project uh, dealy here that I just, I just think is pretty cool. You can also look at things called heterozygosity. So heterozygosity refers to, it's, you're basically just looking at whether or not you have two different variants of an allele from mom and dad or the same variant of an allele. It's very similar to those Punnett squares that you did uh, in high school. And when you look at the haplotypes using sort of these heterozyg heterozygosity studies, what you find is here's our out group in black and the red is African individuals. And this itty bitty teeny tiny little spot right here where yellow spouts out from Africa. And then here again, we see individuals who are from populations no longer in Africa. So they nest within the much older out of, or most, much older African group, which suggests again, another third line of evidence that what we're looking at here is African individuals being the most diverse in every other group uh, diverging and descending from them. This coalescence, and again, I wanna make this clear for the people who are in the audience, coalescence is just math. It has to happen in the case of like common ancestry. This is just how do things coalesce back to a common ancestor? Um, and here we have it, the coalescence around 200,000 years ago, probably older than that, if you ask me, 300,000 tends to be what we say now, uh, but this is a 2012 study um, and out of Africa 80,000 years ago, which is probably a little too late. And lastly, I wanted to talk about, let me see if I've got the last one in here. I might not have grabbed it. I think that was, it. I don't think I grabbed the last study, but what I will show you is if you'll just keep my screen shared for a second here, right. I want to show this is my notes for out of Africa. Actually, I think I've got the link here. I think I have it already ready. Let me find it. A unified genome. This is a 2022 paper that just came out. It's a unified genealogy of all modern and ancient genomes, or rather modern and all ancient genomes that they could get a hold of. And there's a lovely figure in here that I want to share with you, and it's this one. What you see here, as it says, is the visualized inferred human ancestral lineages over time and space. Each line represents an ancestor-descendant relationship in our inferred genealogy of modern and ancient genomes. The width of a line corresponds to how many times the relationship, the relationship is observed, and lines are colored on the estimated age of the ancestor. And what you see here is that the oldest generations, the oldest lines, come again from Africa. There is no getting around this. And then you might be thinking, okay, well, what about the fossils? And the oldest Homo sapiens that we have are 300,000 years old. They come from Morocco. That's Africa again, right? The second oldest come from Ethiopia, the Omo. And then we have some in South Africa as well. So there isn't any getting around. I'm, I'm done here. You can <laughs> There's no way getting around this. G genetically, it's clear as day. Everything nests and converges in on that Central African population. Haplotypes, diversity, that's just the way that it is. And God, there's so many, imp the reason this is so well studied and why this is such a robust thing that we know, piece of knowledge, is because genomes matter for things like health, right? You can tell a lot about the things that you are at risk for based off of things like ancestry. Different people groups have different risks of some genetic illnesses. It's good to know. Uh, and as a result, the human genome industry, as you know, evidenced by the numerous different ways that you can sequence your own genome, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, this is a booming business. And we know a lot about the human genome and how to trace it and coalesce it through time. Um, so if Robert is out there and wants to come put the kibosh on me, trash me, bust me from what I'm saying, he has his work cut out for him. What he needs to do is take apart my... Um, uh, my discussion on bipedality. Tell me why the traits that I've discussed here, the valgus knee, the bull-shaped pelvis, anterior frame and magnum, foot morphology, including arches and inline big toe. Tell me why that, that, that doesn't necessitate bipedality, right? As a suite, because we find the whole suite in australopithecines. Then you've got to take a look at our, our uh, the age of different hominin fossils that we have, right? The, the nature of these different admixtures. Tell me why this, this 
Admixture within Africa is so archaic, a super archaic lineage, rather than just another uh, hominid bopping around like Neanderthals or Denisovans or anything that everyone else was interbreeding with. You have to tackle things like genetics. You have to tell me and not me, really, you're telling every geneticist out there that's ever done work on the human genome, why it is that they're actually, their work is just garbage. Um, and since you know, we understood that genetics is part of anthropology, as the world's most dangerous anthropologist, I suspect this is something that he should be able to do. Uh, at, at the very least, we should be able to uh, debunk some of the very clear claims as like, you know, why is why are Africans more diverse than non-Africans? Why does everyone nest within that al zero haplotype? Um, and why can we find, why can we map out of Africa, both paleontologically speaking and genetically speaking, um, from that 50 to 70,000 year old range? So I've kind of said my piece. I don't think that this yeah. video debunked out of Africa. Uh, I think that it aggressively didn't debunk it. And I think that the model that it put up as a challenge to it is a just so story that relies on, I guess, like believing in Atlantis and just accepting that out of Africa is dumb and stupid, actually. Um, anyways, that's it. Now we'll turn this over to the audience. And now you can engage and uh, in favor or against bring whatever you want. And I will make sure that I put your, your links in the description, Erica, when we're done. Also, I'd like to pin it. Actually, you might want to pin it. Uh, so comment it. I'll pin it up in the comments when we're done with this live. Now to the top and working down Robert Herring. If you're still in the chat, thank you for the super chat. What's with all the, this Robert hate? <laughs> Laugh out loud. Love to all. Thank you, Robert, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Sorry, Robert. So, yeah. He's like, are you talking about me? Uh, notice <laughs> it's always about us, right? Always. About always. Us. Yeah. Always. Um, yeah. If you're wanting to challenge, you got something to say, super chat your question. I'll take it. I'm like literally open to your question. So here we go. Um, Anatonius Black. Thank you for the super chat. Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, a brief history of humankind lays out the interbreeding theory of evolution, linear evolutionary versus interbreeding theory is just an opinion. Do you know anything about this? Um, yeah, I've read, I've read Sapiens. Um, I'm not really sure how much it's been a while since I've read it, but I'm not really sure how much Harari goes into like li the linear evolution theory versus the interbreeding theory. They're both true. This We know this to be the case. Linear evolution, you kind of have to define. I'm assuming it here as like, do populations yield successive populations that can change or evolve through time? Yes, of course they can. We see this happening today. But that being said, when two populations diverge, right, there's a period of time where those two diverged populations can still exchange genes, right? Gene flow, it's actually a, a big barrier to speciation. Uh, and usually you only get that reproductive barrier if these two literally can't interact anymore. And then they have time to kind of mutate and diversify um, to create that reproductive barrier, whether it's cellular or, you know, it, it physical even. Like sometimes it's just a mechanical issue. The two parts don't fit together. <laughs> um, but that usually happens after a long period of, of geographic isolation. So these are both true. Um, but I published a video today on how species are kind of just a nonsense concept anyways. Um, just so everybody knows, let me share <laughs> it. I got to share it. It's just, just, so you need to go subscribe. It's you right. It. Yeah. Let me do this there again. it is. Species aren't real. It's a sassy video. I'll put it in I'm, the chat actually while you're talking. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. And I stuck uh, in the private chat here in StreamYards. I gave you a link to my Google doc that has all my sources. I got There's it. about 15 of them and it says Derek sources at the bottom. So you can see. I'll comment or. I was going to say, have you come out, pin your, pin your uh, YouTube channel so we can get some subscribers over there to check you out. But uh, Oh, you want me to comment my YouTube channel in the side after chat? The, after the show, just just uh, do a regular comment oh, like yeah. you would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Cool. Yeah, so I, I would propose to Antonius that interbreeding and linear evolution, these can both just exist simultaneously. Um, if, you're, if you're presenting them as if they are theories that are diametrically opposed, I don't think that that's true, and I think that I've presented a case that it isn't here. Antonius is back. Thank you for that super chat. Robert's perspective is shared with the religion groups den denotatively classified as hyperborean shamanism and the Aryan myths, a 1000 history of the religions classified as Semitic monotheisms. 
I don't even know where to begin yeah. with. I will, I will say in my in my research on Robert the person, a lot of people said that there was some serious anti-Semitism going on there. And I don't know enough about the subjects that he's covering, but like I don't think it's necessarily that Robert himself is anti-Semitic. I think that it's that the the views that he ascribes to are like universally Used like by people holstered, yeah, holstered yeah. in anti-Semitism. Um which isn't great. <laughs> it's not, yeah. you don't love to see that. Um, but I've, again, I only watched Robert's uh, out of Africa video for this today. And then I tried to research about where he's coming from as a person. So I don't, and I haven't read all of his books either. Apparently that apparently there's one of them that's like really dicey, but I don't know. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, back again. Uh, and, and Antonius, thank you again. Native American religions are classified under hyperborean shamanism, a, akin to every Aryan religion. A good look into bear cult festivals helped me see that. I don't know anything about bear cult uh, festivals. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Well, can I make a quick note, Derek? Yeah. Someone in the chat has accused me of well poisoning. I want to make something abundantly clear. You can be um, like a, an anti-Semite or a racist or a supremacist or whatever. You can be those things and then also be wrong, right? Th those two things often have a big overlapping Venn diagram. But like the stuff that we discussed today that Robert was wrong about, he was just wrong about. They, yeah. they don't necessarily have to be tied to the fact that other people have also said he is those things, right? right? I'm just here to say what he was wrong about biologically in biological anthropology or paleontological but you did come across a lot of stuff researching to investigate a little bit further on his background and things and you saw some of this stuff so you're just saying why is there all of this stuff out there and it's just you know. if one of those if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck you might want to consider the fact that it could potentially be a duck but yeah like if you want to accuse me of well poisoning then you know usually well poisoning is is something that you do in order to make people swallow the pill that you're then giving them afterwards more easily. But like, tell me what I'm actually wrong about. Where, where did my arguments go awry here? Individual yeah. in chat. What was I incorrect about? Where, how did I botch the genetics? How's, yeah. How are the hominins that I discuss actually quadrupedal, right? How's the aquatic ape theory valid? If you want to accuse me of well poisoning, you also have to, you're all by accusing me of well poisoning, well poisoning saying i oh, yeah dude she's she's all about at home and she didn't actually make real arguments i'm listening tell me what i got wrong yeah marlia i hope i'm saying your name properly thank you love you both guts it try mixing uh 0.5 tablespoon bicarbonate of soda <laughs> with four ounces of water and drink slowly it should help your tummy i am always i'm i'm gut sick gut sick of some of this pseudoscientific nonsense <laughs> Doc Pleuromonot, thank you for the super chat. Good to see you here. Granted, I'm a neophyte. Couldn't Bauer's hydra hydridization or even multi-regional models resolve the hard stance OOA differences? I don't know. What yeah, so what, what he's saying is kind of what I said earlier. So the multi-regional hypothesis, again, uh, discussed this idea that the, the, the oldest version of it anyways, that the modern races of humans are in existence because they have different most recent hominin ancestors. Um, and then the multi-regional has evolved a bit over time to become less like that and more along the lines of like, yeah, you know, people, people groups did do some evolution in their given locations after they moved there, whether they were homo sapiens and maybe some people groups were able to hybridize with other hominins more easily than others. To me, a lot of this stuff gets busted again by, by the genetics work, how similar all humans are to one another today. Uh, and how these hybridizations actually occurred, as in how much genetics do we actually carry from these ancient hominins. So in my opinion, out of Africa is true, um, and, and demonstrably so, humans, homo sapiens, did leave Africa in this final big burst 50 to 70,000 years ago. That being said, there is support for attempts at leaving Africa prior to that. They did not work. In fact, there's a spot um, in, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Arapaima cave. It's not Arapaima. Uh, Apidum. Let me, I looked it up earlier today. Hold on. Give me a second. Apid. Apidema. I think that's it. Apidema. 
one skull. Let me double check this. I don't want to give anybody apodema. Yeah, the apodema caves. So there's a spot in, in sort of the, the Grecian area where you've got these caves and there's two skulls that have been found in the cave. One's Neanderthal, one's Homo sapiens. The Homo sapiens skull is primitive Homo sapiens, but it's Homo sapiens nonetheless. And they're dated to around 100,000, 150,000, something like that years ago, but they're different ages. And it turns out the Homo sapiens skull is older than the Neanderthal skull. So what that suggests to anthropologists is that humans moved out, made it to this area, and they either retreated or were replaced somehow by Neanderthals who then dwelled there until the second um, sort of successful big burst of humans where they actually made it all the way out of Africa. Um, and so in this way, you could propose that there's more than one hard line stance for out of Africa that, or rather, the out of Africa that is legitimate isn't this hard line stance. It's much more flexible outside of that big single ex explosion diverge or uh diversification and dispersal event that happened 50 to 70k ya mm -hmm. if that makes sense thank you thank you drew window just in case you're demonetized <laughs> drew thank you for that man uh yeah that might end up happening what can you do i don't know uh moving to the next one let's keep scrolling here we've had lots of chat here so Try not to let get too much of it get under your skin there. Uh, I know you're, there's so many trolls. I'm so glad you didn't pay attention to the chat uh, during a lot of the conversation. There were just so many antagonists. So stop scamming, man. Thank you for the super chat. If you're skeptical of the existence of Atlantis, are you familiar with the findings of Dr. Joshua Sweet and MJ Thatch? I'm not familiar with their work. And this individual, I imagine, is probably going to say, huh, then how can you be trash talking Atlantis if you're not even reading the literature on Atlantis? I don't care if Atlantis is real or not. There's a huge difference between saying Atlantis was a place that maybe existed and people who lived in Atlantis were a hyper advanced race of superhumans that selectively interbred with, I guess, like white people or and Asians. Um, I guess that's what's what was being said in sort of the, the Peter video, um, Peter, the Robert video. Um, but yeah, like I'm not against the existence of Atlantis. I haven't seen anything compelling for it um right. but i've not read the work of these people maybe they'll change my mind i definitely would be yeah i don't think stop scamming man's always in the chat so he's he's actually a friend of the channel um i'm open-minded to look at this i am very cautious i think that it's anachronistic in many ways like plato's acting like this civilization nine thousand years before him is like well documented down through the tradition and that like he even uses if i'm not mistaken athenians are in the narrative, like as if they're engaging with this island, the Athenian, you know, Greeks, 9,000 years before I'm highly suspect of the whole thing. So I would be happy to look at anyone who might actually take a case, but I wonder why we can't really find exactly where it is. It's always 20 different locations and right. it, it's super speculative. Yeah. And, and the issue with that too, is there's also a dip. So there's a difference between the two things I said earlier. And there's also a difference between Atlantis was a place that existed. And it was like, uh, again, a hyper advanced, you know, civilization destroying, incredibly um, technologically well endowed place. Um, and then it kind of makes you wonder like, okay, you know, they're, they're super advanced, but they got beat out by like a volcanic eruption. What did none of them make it off the island? Um, and I don't think it can be the Canary Islands either, because when I was looking into the Canary Islands as this potential location, because uh, the Canary Islands is proposed are like the top of a mountain that the island sank because of a volcanic eruption, um, yeah, it would have to be really, really far underwater and a cataclysm, a cataclysm strong enough to sink that entire mountain range in like a day or even like a year or two would be so geologically evident it's crazy. This would be like the biggest, one of the biggest natural disasters of all time that, that this entire island that's large sank beneath the sea so many miles underneath the water. Um, I mean, you would have felt it on the other side of the globe, tectonically speaking. So it, I don't think it can be the Canary Islands. And like, again, like the, the folks who are saying, yeah, you know, like Erica, she's indoctrinated. She, she's got all these bad takes. She's only been, she's only saying this because she's been potted and she's parroting it. Like, okay, then then why do none of the people, like Robert, why aren't they actually arguing with the real data? Why aren't they arguing with the actual fossils? Why aren't they taking apart the genetic studies like the 2022 one that just came out? Why didn't Robert, the world's most dangerous anthropologist, sit down with this paper and explain piece by piece 
why it's incorrect. You know, the, these folks are supposed to be the ones who are taking down the paradigm, but then they spend all their time doing everything but that. So one one question I have, and I want to get to the next super chat is, is you looked online last night for any publications, hoping to find something academic. I didn't find anything. I didn't find anything by Robert. So, um, And, you know, I'm not published right now either. I'm currently in the process of trying to publish my master's thesis, but like I'm a student. Anybody who is actually in the field of anthropology, if you have a job as a professor, you damn well better be published. I don't think you could get a job as a professor um, in really any field if you've never published a single work. Like, surely you would have published your PhD dissertation. Like, it should be available online. Uh, or your master's thesis or an honors thesis from your bachelor's. Um, and the whole reason that this is important isn't because it's some elitist science you know, club. It's because it shows that you have the ability to create something that is is scientifically robust that has a usually a statistical analysis to it um and you're capable of being peer reviewed simple thank you uh i look uh i believe five i uh, maybe i'm missing up the word thank you for the super chat has guts it heard of the theories proposed by the scholar riley martin he was a black he was black and absolutely argued against the out of africa theory he claimed we are descended from alien human hybrids I have not heard of that, but I don't care that he's like, it just doesn't matter the race of the person proposing the idea. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter uh, whether if your science is robust, it should stand on its own and it should be completely independent from, you know, your, your sex or your gender or your race, which is why like being like, look, he's even African. And he says he's black. He says that it's this, I, I don't care. Right. The, the world was a very, very racist place in the 1800s and in the early 1900s. And, even pretty recently. <laughs> and yet, scientists knew that humans began in Africa because the second someone went down there and started looking, they started pulling up transitional hominids, things that weren't quite apes, but weren't quite human. Australopithecus africanus was discovered by Raymond Dart in South Africa in like the 20s to the 40s, you know? And, and then people stayed. That at this time, there were doctors wasting their lives digging around in the UK trying to find these transitional species. They found nothing. They never found anything. And the reason is because it didn't happen there. If the, if the racist ideals of the, uh, of the late 18th, early 19th century couldn't keep the anthropologists from coming down and like doing their work, and granted, it cast a shadow on the entire operation, um, but like, if they if they can if they can look at the data and say, yeah, well, I guess it was in Africa, you know, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it seems like if it's that ubiquitous and has continued to be shown robust by countless works in genetics and field sites that are currently being excavated now as I speak, I don't see why there's reason to throw that all away because one person says that we're alien human hybrids, especially if they show up without any data. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah, I was just looking up on Google to see if I could find it. And I think I found a, a gentleman, but I, I, I'm not going to waste any much any more time on it. Stop scamming, man. Thank you for the super chat. On a historical side, Robert's claims about the religious group, the Cathars, that they are uh, that they guarded a holy bloodline as bunk concocted no earlier than the 70s. They were ardent anti-materialist dual dualist. Interesting. That's so, not yeah. surprising. Yeah. Yeah. There's all sorts of, uh, it seems like he's reading very, uh, old material in, in it, many ways in conspiracy theory types. So, well, and it's just the same, it's the same thing that we get from a lot of the young earth creationists. It's this desire to be supreme and special and above the rest of the life that exists on this planet. It's a desire to separate oneself and schism from nature to be something divine. And like, I'm sorry, but that there's just nothing to support that. Humans are remarkable creatures. And in a lot of ways, we are truly unique, but we're not exceptional. Like, we're not the only thing that does a lot of the stuff that, that we do. There are a scant few things that are human specific, but most animals have a, a few things that only they do. Mm -hmm. um, and moreover, there's there's so much unity and you know beauty in finding this connection with the rest of the animal kingdom but not only that it's through that exploration that we found unity within our own species we're remarkably non-diverse genetically speaking because we're all just one big group of creatures yeah we're what will this do to tribalism in the long run right like yeah finding out we're all related and it connected as a family if you will yeah. 
we're, we're all one big, big organ, you know, all one big species from this one s small population of organisms bopping around sometime, how, wherever we want to consider humanity as beginning, whether it's the beginning of the Australopithecines kicking around the savanna 3.7 or rather 4.2 million years ago, or Artipithecus with 4.4, wherever you want to say that it began, though, the beginnings were humble. And that's what makes our journey to being here, having this conversation, using this complex technology so cool. There, there's <laughs> grandeur, to quote Darwin, right? Like there's grandeur in this view of life and in, in this unity among people and among organisms. I, I think it's cool. And to say that there's, you know, there's some kind of like, what do you say, Afrocentric Marxism. No, <laughs> I, like, I just don't know what to tell you, right? Like people looked everywhere else before they looked in Africa because of dumb racist bullshit. And then they went to Africa and were pulling up hominins by truckload, right? It's just, it is what it is. If, if you can't, but, but this is what happens, right? Like people can't square the idea that all of humanity began in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so they have to come up with, with reasons why it must be nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. No, it's yeah. sad. I mean, imagine okay. if, and, and I'm just playing a hypothetical that I want to get to the next super chat is, uh, imagine when your creation myth tells you that Eden, somewhere in the Middle East, must be where man first was created. Now, imagine if you're if you're thinking this way, you can't let it go down into Africa. You can't if you're sticking to a geographic location, and this is where God made Adam and Eve, et cetera. Of course, there's modern ways to get around this. People want to keep, you know, changing things. But my point is, is when the stories tell you things, you run to these locations you think they're at and you can't allow it to be from these places. Then you add in color and all sorts of stuff. Oh, anyway, stops gaming, man. Again, there doesn't seem to be many hominid finds in West Africa. Why is this terrain not good for preservation? Lack of exploration? It's both. Um, and it's also, uh, unfortunately, political unrest. It's very difficult to get a permit and go out in West Africa. They've got a lot of these nations have bigger things on their plate to worry about than, you know, giving some scientists the permission to come around with a trowel and dig around in the desert. That being said, there are some finds that are more towards Central and West Africa. The oldest hominin we know of is from Chad, for instance, say like this Chadensis. But on top of that, a lot of West Africa is jungly and forested and it turns out jungle soil is like the worst enemy of fossils because it's so acidic, right? In order to be able to, to fuel these big canopies and, and massive amounts of foliage, for whatever reason, the soil tends to be pretty acidic in jungles and acidic soil just annihilates bones. It can't permineralize. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a combination of terrain bad for preservation. People haven't gone there and, and looked because of political reasons, um, both of those things. Stops gave a man again. There are blondes in Malaysia, uh, Melanesia. This, of course, means the continent of Lemur Lemur is it Lemuria? Lemuria, Lemuria? Israel. I don't know about the continent of Lemur Lemuria. So, but thank I you like so much. <laughs> Appreciate the super chat, my friend. Getting down to the next one. I, like, I know you're biting your teeth at some of these comments, probably too. So, I'm like, let's hurry up and get to the. Okay, Scott Duke, Erica, would you rather discover fossils or study the fossils that others have found? Oh, Scott is in the chat. Hello, Scott. Um, we we met awesome. him, yeah, in Texas. So Yeah, Scott's awesome. I love Scott. Um, yeah, uh, if, if I had my dream, I would analyze fossils other people have found and then go out into the field to observe living primates. So I would like to do primatology and I would like to work, use my, my experience in primatology and the morphology of living primates to inform uh, analysis of past organisms. Thank you. Thank you. If I'm going to, if I'm going to be out in the field, I want to at least see something alive. Right. And, uh, Antonius, thank you for the super chat sapiens, a brief history of humankind book by Yuval Noah Harari for the other side of this topic. It's not a bad thing to disagree. Uh, no way age of clay. Sapiens is a good book. That's what I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to the next one, Bradford Baldwin. Good to see you here. Pit down, man, is a note of in, uh, a note in how it led science to be more strict about discoveries and helped to usher in the peer review process. So as bad as the hoax was, it was beaten by better science and helped make it better. This is true. Uh, and part of the reason why it took so long to discover that Pit Down Man was a hoax is because uh, its keepers wouldn't let anyone look at it. Uh, and Dawson was an amateur, Charles Dawson. I think it's funny that he's the discoverer of Piltdown Man because his name is so close to Charles Darwin. But he, uh, yeah, he was he was not an anthropologist or an archaeologist. He was like an amateur out there 
look what I found. And everyone was like, oh, it's so cool. It's what a great fossil find. But, you know, at the time we didn't have much fossil material and no one had gone and looked in Africa yet. We, so we were like, oh, yes, you anthropus. It's clearly a, a real thing. But yeah, an excellent point. It made, made science more robust as a result. And I want to thank you for that big super chat, my friend. Conan Lee, good to see you here. I do not normally do super chats in principle, but there was one important bit missed in the last video clip. Those who support the pit down man theory and the TV support the out of Africa theory. And the I guess the I guess the proposition is that what one thing that Robert said is like the same people promoting out of Africa are promoting or the same ones that promoted the Piltdown man, uh. like anthropologists. Like, I guess the idea is that it's, if you're in anthropology and you fell for Piltdown man out of Africa is just as likely to be wrong. But I think it's really strange to say that because out of Africa's greatest support doesn't come from the fossils. It comes from the genetics and geneticists, were not around when Piltdown Man was found, right? Like genetics wasn't even a thing yet. I mean, Mendel was a thing, but other than that, like the field hadn't even come into its own. So it's the geneticist who you want to pick a fight with if you really want to take down out of Africa. Thank you so much, Conan. And I am love your energy is contagious, by the way, Erica, just so you know. <laughs> Uh, I love this stuff. I love you are so nobody talks about evolution and gets into this as energetic as you are. It's my favorite thing. It really oh, well, I, Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, definitely if you haven't subscribed to Esoterica, you should. Justin Sledge should. on mysticism, all of the things that you would want in mythology and ancient magic and stuff without the ontology. So he's going to give you scholarly information on topics that you might find on Robert Seffer's channel, my channel, et cetera. The difference is, is on compared to Robert's is you're going to find good evidence-based reasons that, are, you know, on a lot of these topics from mysticism and secret societies that might've been in the yeah, ancient yeah. world and stuff, instead of actually believing that this is what's really going on. So please go check out Justin Sledge. All right. All right. His channel's growing massively too, by the way. It's yeah, like, I was really glad to see that as well. Benson, I hope we get some controversy here, right? Benson, thank you for the super chat. Funny thing is there are a tremendous amount of blonde-haired, light-eyed, black-skinned Malay people. I discovered this during my time doing humanitarian aid in the U.S. Navy after the tsunami in 2007. Yeah, no, I, I believe that because hair color isn't necessarily like linked to skin color. So these two things can be under different kinds of selection. Mm, thank you so much for that. Flying Ardilla, thank you for the super chat. Mummy hair color has to do with conditions of preservation more than anything. Dark hair pigment does not preserve well. Many mummies have red hair solely because the pigment broke down. I did not know that. I didn't. Everything that I study is too old to preserve hair, but that's that's awesome. That's boy, that's worth hmm. looking into. Yeah, I definitely hmm. want to know more about that. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you for the super chat. Gnostic informant, it's great to see the truth always prevails. What is Erica's current video project? By the oh. way, you got to subscribe to Gnostic informant. Neil, he's like, it's sister brother channel. Like you really it's should go subscribe. Yeah, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Current current video project. I'm working on a couple of different things. I've got a really cool, I've got a really cool, uh, more art, more art inspired video on like the, the human relationship to the rest of, uh, to the other apes, like what it is to be a hominid. Uh, but I also have, I've got some really good debunks on the pipeline right now. They're scripted, they're ready to go, but I just have to sit down and actually do them. And they're like, they're the, they're my, one of my favorite kind of videos to make because they're like, I, I get to be kind of spicy and stick a bunch of jokes and memes and cartoons in there. So people who like that kind of thing uh, should get hype because I've got, I've got some good stuff on that. And then next week I have a video on Kenny Anthropus Platyops, which is a really weird hominin. It's like a sciencey video. So I don't know. I got something for everyone in the pipeline. Yes, you do. I got to give that uh, just, it is in the comments. It's pinned in the chat. I'm posting it again, just so everybody goes subscribe to the channel. Thank you, Gnostic Informant. I appreciate it, my friend. Avaros, good to see you here. Spec uh, sp what is it? Speciation, sorry, is real to the extent that closely related species aren't able to interbreed or their offspring are infertile. If so, then can we say genetically races or human subspecies breeds are real? No, uh, race is not a biological term that is in any kind, 
in any shape, form or fashion used in the modern day, because with the advent of genetics, this idea that race was something tangible and not just kind of this phenotypically plastic trait for different areas kind of got blown out of the water. So race is not considered to be a, a sound biological term. As far as I know, I never see it used. Um, now, it's interesting that you say speciation being related to interbreeding because that's really great for organisms that exist today. But what do you do about classifying species in the past where you can't actually tell what could interbreed with what? For all intents and purposes, Australopithecines probably have interbred with early members of genus Homo, just given the fact that they're so close temporally and they're not all that different morphologically. So should we really call them different species? I don't really know. That my ooh, my recent video on species addresses this, and the conclusion yeah. is that species concepts, none of them work ubiquitously through time and across space, and considering asexual organisms and things like that. It and that's because, like, quite frankly, the tree of life is a gradient, it always has been, right? Drawing it, it's like trying to pick where red emerges on a color gradient. I say that every time because I think picturing a color gradient is such a good way of a, a good way of putting it. It's how it was explained to me. Um, but it's easy when you pick a color and say, is it close to red or is it close to orange? But it's a lot harder to pick on a gradient when you have the whole thing in front of you, where one thing ends, where one color ends and another one begins. And it's because defining colors, just like defining species, is just the classic human attempt to categorize things. It's taking a static idea of a species or a color and applying it to a dynamic process. Mm. Thank you, Avros, for that uh, super chat. I even plugged your specific species video in the chat so people can go and Sweet. you know watch it right now when we're done. Uh, Stop scamming, man. Good to see you again. Dr. Sweet and MJ Milo James Thatch are Disney characters in a, in the movie Atlantis. So he's this trolling is us. This is true. This is, are, this, is uh, this is the real science. Is this a troll? Or are you trolling Stop Scamming Man? Or are you suggesting that the, the real people are like... That the, the no, this, Disney this, is, race this is an airtight thesis. We've we've been annihilated, Derek. Unfortunately. Jesus. Ah, what I am I going to do? I hate getting. I hate when my my whole worldview gets blown to smithereens on camera. It doesn't happen all the time. Well, usually when people bring up Disney movies, my ideas aren't long for this world. Yeah, stop scamming, man! Like you got to teach me the tricks. You know that. Uh, thank you for the support, my friend, and it's good to see you in the chat, Jordan. Uh, JMD, JMD 74, just curious, but could you explain why it is that we apparently made it to Australia before the Middle East or Indus Valley? Didn't we have to pass through it or through in the migration route? Yeah, there's some interesting thoughts about that. It may just be based off of where people finally settled down, right? So it may be that we did pass through them and no one stayed. Um, some of the reasons why people have proposed that migration even happened in the first place was because we were following game trails. So maybe the situation is that we were following a big group of wildebeest or whatever the heck is moving through this area, and we just passed right through. And by the time we lost the trail, maybe we were just closer to Australia. Um, it also could be that, and this this is like a really interesting thing to think about, like, did we make it to Australia intentionally or were people like swept there? I know that's like a tough thing to imagine, but if you're if you're in the area of Southeast Asia, right, those currents go north to south. So it wouldn't really be super difficult to end up there. It wouldn't take that long. Although I think that's much more far-fetched than the idea that we just sailed there eventually, especially because, you know, other hominins clearly were, were capable of maneuvering between at least short distances on water. I think that's a great question. I have no idea, really. I'm kind of just speculating here. Yeah, no, I get it. And it, when you just don't have hard evidence right you don't have the hard evidence to base it off of you have to kind of figure out well they got here somehow you know and and it's obviously not an alien spaceship that landed in atlantis came and picked them up on the way and just dropped them off over well maybe that is true you know what what i will what i will tell you is i just pulled up my notes on this because I, I had a whole series of notes over like when people arrived there i think people just did stay in those areas like the industry River valley etc because what i have is that it's it's Australia around 50,000 years ago, East Asia, as far as settling is 45,000 years ago, as well as Europe, uh, and North America is last. So it could be that the whole time people are traveling and traversing their way to the area where they would, you know, cast off to get to Australia, people were schisming off and settling. Because I've, I've seen no data to say, at least in my notes, I could be wrong. Again, like late genus homo is what I study professionally. I study Miocene names, but, um, and extant primates. But uh, that being said, 
It could just be that they they were settling in those places, and it's just the ones that kept going that made it to Australia. Jordan, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Avros is back again. What if we did not emerge from common genetic source? Human common cause should not be based on ancestry, that speciesism, but platonic essence. So well, I you'll have to categorize what platonic essence is. You have to, if, if it is to be investigated by science, it must be empirically chartable. You have to at least be able to take something down and it has to be governed by natural laws. Otherwise, yeah, you're still investigating, but it ceases to be science because there's no way to make really any, any predictions. There's no, there's no way to ground it, if that makes sense. Um, now, saying that it's speciesism, like necessarily ancestry and genetic sources are linked. Right. The only assumption that is made there is that Mendel's rules of inheritance, his laws of inheritance, work consistently through time. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all life on Earth shares the same genetic code. Um, that that seems like it would be quite far fetched unless for something like that to evolve more than once. Now, if you want to say it's a common designer, that's a different story entirely. And if that's the case, then, you know, what you have to do is create criteria for design. How do you tell the difference between a designed organism and what natural change can can produce? Um, and that's been the constant, that's been the albatross around the neck of, of intelligent design advocates for over a decade. You deal with that a lot. Thank you so much, Avaros. Uh, Cosmic, thank you for the super chat. This conversation is appreciated, especially since people want to believe instead of Africans creating civilization, it was aliens or lost Atlanteans. It's a classic move. It, it is a classic. Isn't it funny how when you watch show, and I've watched plenty of ancient aliens myself. Uh, but I enjoy it, the show. It's just. <laughs> no, I, I listen to people, people are saying like, I don't give it a fair hearing. And I guess since I'm not like ankle deep in the literature, the literature of these things, right. since I don't know most of the, the, the professionals that are being proposed here, but like I consume on a light level, some of this kind of media um, and these explanation videos and stuff like that. And it's so strange to me that they're like, they're like, oh my God, the the ziggurats of Central America, they couldn't have been made by, by the brown people that lived there, right? It had to have been aliens who were coming in and doing this. And then it's like, but other things that like Europeans were doing, that's all fine. Uh, that that was clearly humans, right? It's that is I don't exactly know, it's kind of weird. My I'm not the only person that's noticed this. Digit, no, you're not the only person. Digital Hammurabi actually has done responses to the ancient uh, aliens hypothesis. And the reason why they are really good for this is they know Akkadian and Sumerian, and they know exactly how these, the Zechariah <laughs> Sitchin, all these ancient alien guys who are acting like the gods came down and manufactured genetic code to make human slaves to go get them gold for their planet or whatever they interpret. They know the language. They know these myths, and they're able to go, no, that's not what these words mean. Zachariah Sitchin, they're highly suspect of the way he has, he doesn't even know the language like he should. So we have advanced, of course, in understanding the Akkadian and Sumerian and just all of this language. And they're like, no. And even him and his wife brought that up to me and said, it's very supremacy orientated. Like, how could these Native Americans ever come up with a pyramid? You know, like, how could they in Giza? That's not possible. And so- it's yeah, and it's just really interesting because the same thing happened with I guess this video with Robert in it, right? Is it's people who are not vested in the field that it is they're trying to debunk coming in and debunking it. So it's like, okay, it's generally good practice to know the argument that you're overturning before you try to overturn it. Uh, if you can't read Sumerian and you don't know Akkadian and you're coming in and saying, no, no, the humans couldn't have possibly done this, I allow me to rewrite all of you know the ancient Near East. <laughs> And in accordance with my alien theory, it's like, okay, well. It's not that he doesn't know some. They said he just, he did not have Sumerian down pack. And he he made interpretations and things that were like, you know, 101 Sumerian students would know by today's standards. So, and I don't think the Sumerian, like, I mean, it was Rosetta Stone from there forward. We're trying to learn these languages and understand what they were saying. So he's in an early phase that we have come a long way since. So anyway, moving on. Exit Music, great show. More shows with Erica in the future, hopefully. I will, we will, div like, if you don't mind, we'll deify you here on the channel. And have I'll you talk, on. I will talk all of you to death. That's a promise. We love you. No, we love you. We oh, no, no, no. Come, come now, Derek. 
I've been checking in with the side chat. I know there are some Gutsy Gibbon haters in the chat. And I'm all I want to say to that is like, okay, then debunk me then. Just destroy my arguments. If you don't like me so much, I'm so indoctrinated. I'm a I'm a duplicitous femoid coming on here dispelling my my evil Afrocentric Marxism. Like just tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> like debunk the arguments. It, it's so lazy to come up here and be like, you know, I mean, it would have been so easy for me to come up here and be like, I don't think Robert's a real anthropologist, and that's why he's wrong, because he's indoctrinated by the, the the evil cabal of, like, new Nazi scientists or some nonsense like that. Yeah. But instead, I'll sit here and tell you why his arguments are wrong. Yeah. So offer me the same courtesy. Go forth. Destroy Out of Africa and Gutsit Gibbon systematically by going through every paper and fossil specimen that I mentioned here and telling me why I'm wrong and stupid, actually. That's Otherwise, why I did what I, I did during <laughs> during our recording. That's why I was like, hey, how come you haven't uh, defended yourself in this whole political jab? You're like, I'm going to just deal with the data. We're going to actually show you and explain to you why this is ridiculous. So I give yeah, it to you. Like, that's not what I'm here to do. You know, I mean, you get someone who actually knows that. I mean, if you want to get into the politics stuff, I'm like a, I'm like a pinhead with that stuff. So <laughs> I'm just saying that that's what yeah. he was trying to accuse you of. And you're like, oh, yeah, like, like what do you mean? I just yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about it because I, I certainly don't have the authority to speak on that stuff. So far be it for me to pretend like I do. That would be something that we would look down upon. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Hmm. Johnny or John Spinoza, thank you for the super chat. Erica, belief in lost civilization twelve thousand years ago has zero to do with the macro evolution or aliens. Derek, please have Graham Hancock or Randall Carlson on to discuss younger drives. I am actually in contact with Randall Carlson. Um, he's a catastrophist. So he thinks that there's been like multiple major impacts on earth that uh, I think he disagrees with the mainstream on particular in some of these details, but uh, I'd be happy to have him on. I'd be happy the, to have the conversations. The thing about this is like, I kind of tend to agree with the sentiment that belief in a lost civilization doesn't necessarily intrinsically have anything to do with macro evolution or aliens. Right. That's true, yeah. but I'm not the one that linked them, right? Robert's the one in the video who starts talking about how dumb human evolution is. And then he he uses that as his stepping stone to talk about Atlantis. That wasn't me, Joni. Yeah, <laughs> don't, yeah, no, don't no. Me. No, I don't think, I don't think he is. I don't think he is. Uh, I think. Yeah. Okay, Joni, sorry. I, I'm fired up, you know, I'm, I'm No, to you're ready to fight. You're, ah! Okay, I got you. Uh, is it Tibor? Tibor, forgive me. Thank you for the super chat. No question. Thanks for the lively conversation, guys. Thank you. Sweet. Crossover maniac. Does the cube square law favor fossilization of larger life forms since less of the mass of the remains is exposed to the weathering and acidic soil in, prop in proportion to those of smaller animals? Um, yes. And also they're just less fragile, right? So like the, but I guess that would play into the, the square cube law is actually going to make, I mean, the stuff is bigger and it's more robust. So we'll just say yes, but there's a lot taphonomically that goes on with this larger species bias that we definitely have in the fossil record. And that sucks for people that study small stuff, right? Like that, that really sucks. Like if you're like a rodent person and you study a lot of like early mammals, you know, in the, in you know, the Permian and into, um, or not the Permian, uh, well, maybe the Permian, but it depends on who you talk to. If you're saying like Cretaceous soil and you're like, I want to study how mammals radiate after the Cretaceous extinction, it's like, you're going to find teeth and that's pretty much it, right? Like yeah. nothing else because they're so teeny, except enamel. Enamel's really robust. Thank you, Crossover Maniac. Critical faculty, good to see you here, Hanny. Go subscribe. In fact, tomorrow... Let me just get this straight before I even read it. This is important, especially you gave such a big super chat. I really appreciate the love. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Tomorrow we are on uh, tomorrow morning and we're going to be dealing with uh, at least maybe seven scientific facts, supposedly that the Quran predicts and that knows he's going to be debunking them, of course, because uh, that's one of the apologist uh, angles to prove that it's like. This is true. So be looking out for that tomorrow. This is brilliant. Thanks, Erica and Derek. Although both bipedal, wouldn't the size of the canine and and uh, tilting of thigh bones be good markers to differentiate Australopithecus? I can't even pronounce this. And uh, genus Homo and is natural selection enough to explain speciation? 
it's natural selection isn't enough to explain speciation. You need mutation plus natural selection. So the, the mutation is another mechanism of evolution. The four mechanisms, gene flow, genetic drift, natural selection, mutation. So you got to have a lot of those, at least two, mutation and something else acting in order to select on new material for speciation. As far as canine size and the tilting of the thigh bones, it's dicey because things are already pretty efficient bipeds by late australopithecines and the canines are already tiny. So canines really aren't going to be doing much more decreasing by the time you go from Australopithecus to Homo. They're about as, I mean, if you look at, if I were to pull one of my paranthropus jaws from behind me, 3D printed, not real, although that would be epic, and compare my canines to its, my canines are going to be about the same size as paranthropus, which is, you know, not another offshoot, a cousin of ours. And the same is going to be true for later Australopithecine. So the tilting of the thigh bones, generally speaking, people propose Homo is going to be more efficient at bipedality. So maybe, but it's going to be real slight. Mm. Thank you for that answer. And I am putting your uh, YouTube channel in the uh, chat so everybody can go subscribe to my buddy, Critical Faculty. Oh, oh wait, hold on, Derek. I've been informed by Joe Shoes in the chat that, uh, that, that Robert won't debunk me because I'm a waste of time. And also... Because, uh, yeah. and, and he's what apparently he's watching, right? Hi, Robert. Well, I would love to have him come on, I would even be Robert, happy to send him a link. And Robert, why would you be afraid? I'm, I'm just another anthropologist, I'm just, I'm just another. Well, I guess I'm not an it. See, here's the difference though I wouldn't call myself an anthropologist yet because I don't have my PhD. Um, so I'm just a primatologist because I have my M resin on. Just, just debunk me, dude. Come on, if it's so easy and I'm not worth your time, just debunk me. Yeah, you're I'm such a if I'm such a, a ding dong to be easy for for the most dangerous anthropologist like you. I'm being rude. I, I'm being yeah. sad. I'm sorry, Robert. I I actually really did like the part of your video with the goose. I you probably missed that part earlier. No, he I does really that in in most of his videos. He has like a scene where he's like with nature, right? It's just part well, of his. What? And that's great. Like that's yeah. awesome. Like you know, good good for you. I, I like the the theme of the videos, but you know, just debunk me, bro. Come on. I, I'm afraid of you. Why, why would he want to? I mean, like, <laughs> I, was, I wouldn't even touch you. I, I honestly, I don't know anything about what you are skilled at in terms of this. So Conan Lee, sorry, the point is still missed. The oh, Piltdown man was trying to prove white supremacy. It is a theory opposed to the uh, automatic reasoning. Hence, Sefer is wrong to conflate it with the media TV OOA. That's actually a really good point, Conan, and it's not something that I really harped on. So I'm glad I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah, I, I touched on I guess a little saying that the Piltdown skull is a forgery. That the remains of the Piltdown manor it's a human cranium or actually a human skull uh, with the jaw of an orangutan, teeth of the canine teeth of the uh, of the chimpanzee, proposed to have been found in the UK, right? So I guess you would be right, and it's got a big brain. So what they were basically saying is that see. The, the mighty the mighty British person <laughs> evolved in the UK with the big brain first because they're British and they're smart. So I, I mean I guess that's a good point. I or I should work on that more. Or somehow the the gods came down and gifted them with this. Who knows? Uh, BK, thank you for the super chat. It's not much, but here's my tithe for the week. Thank you so much, BK, for the tithe. Sweet. You are blessed. Okay, we are caught up on super chat. So if anyone wants to ask a super chat, go for it. But I, I guess, is this time I can unleash my pit bull and let you go to town if you want to? I mean, is there any, anything you want to uh, deal with? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through the side chat. I'm just, you know, I don't know. Like there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of really sweet, like, you know, gutsy given enjoyers out there, which I, yeah. I do love to see. Uh, but you know, like, I'm just, I'm kind of not impressed by some of the folks who are here trying to defend Robert or, you know, who are being emissaries for Robert who won't deign to show up in the chat. Like, I'm just saying, the only things that I presented here today, none of it is opinion based, right? I showed up with genetic work and I showed up with fossils, pictures of fossils, not like people's opinions on what they look like. I just showed you the pictures and I told you what they are and I gave you the data. So like, it should be super easy if I'm, you know, a, a, a dumb lady just hanging out on the internet, vomiting up what I've been taught for you to debunk me. Uh, and by you, I mean any of anybody in the chat who thinks what I'm saying is like lame or, you know, irresponsible or just blatantly incorrect. You have it within your power because get this, Derek, I'm giving you all my sources so you can pin them in the description and these individuals can go 
and show not just me, but the whole scientific community why we're actually really wrong. And the cool part about peer review and the cool part about science in general is that if they feel so inclined, they might even write a paper on it. Robert, you're an anthropologist. Write a paper, submit it. My advisor might be one of your peer reviewers. And then we can talk We can talk about why uh, conventional anthropology is, is so incorrect and, and so unfounded. So Yeah, yeah. You know, I when I went into this, I knew there was going to be a bunch of crazy uh, like uh, antagonists to, to from, you know, his channel, his followers and whatnot for what I do. I hope that some people actually watched it and considered like really consider and go, is he wrong on this? I mean, look, granted, you want to believe in things and you think there's more to the myths go for it. But at the end of the day, like, dealing with the science, I think it's important that we approach these subjects and actually deal with the data, not coming up with wild letter mythology shape how we impact our particular science that we're looking at with the facts and measuring these things from fossil record to genetic, you know, what you've already been going into on this show. I'm wondering if uh, a conversation could happen. I know we're being kind of sarcastic and, and whatnot, but I would love to see him have a conversation with you on these, on these matters. The thing, is, the thing is I can be pretty snarky. That's true. I can be kind of sassy, a little spicy when I get going. Um, but that's because, you know, I feel confident in my claims. I feel confident in my ability to defend them. And like, I want to know if I'm wrong, you know? So I, I yeah. want to be shown that I'm so fervent in wanting to see the data that disproves me. That's why I say so many times, like just, prove me wrong. Or if it's easy, you should be able to do it. Cause I, I, I never want to be in a position that is demonstrably incorrect. Um, that's, that's never something that I want. Uh, and worse than that, I don't want to be out here espousing incorrect things to other people. Right. And the truth is anybody can get on YouTube and talk shit. That's what I do. Um, I try to do real science. I'm trying to get published and do real science in my professional life, but like YouTube's a hobby of mine. And I can get on here and talk smack and whatever, but like real science doesn't function like this. Real science functions in the literature. It functions in the field. It's peer review, it's analysis, it's statistics. It's all of these different things, creating a model and a viable hypothesis, not pointing at random things that you read in some, you know, Nazi excavation book a hundred years ago. I guess it wouldn't be a hundred. I'm like bad with history, whatever, 80 years ago. Um, and like, I, I get a little indignant on this stuff when, you know, I'm, I'm just espousing what the literature says and people are like that the literature isn't worth my time, but I'm also going to overturn. Yeah, there's a conspiracy. This is the same problem we deal with when you like if you should try to talk to flat earthers. Uh, there was a recent video with Flat Earth Dave. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that Robert is this. I'm simply pointing out that the kind of mindset, you can't trust anything. And even in our chat, as we've been going along, some of the fans that are his are in the chat and they're like, well, what you're reading and learning is wrong. And so technically there's a conspiracy that the cabal is giving you all this false data Everything you're looking at genetically, all these images, it's just like the CGI of everything in outer space. You know, it's all <laughs> fake. Everything, you're just regurgitating what you're told. You have no clue what you're doing. Uh, you're just reading off of that. And that the real guy, you got to listen to Robert. You got to listen to the guy who knows, you know, the truth. He's the guy on YouTube who has 240,000 views and he's the one who knows the facts. And you kind of wonder like, what happened? Why is the mind so hesitant to accept what any scientist have to say at all? And why not investigate and overturn it using methodologies that we know work in measuring, testing, and being able to experiment and know, okay, this is what the data looks like. So if it's all a lie, everything, all of our methods are wrong. And it seems that he's borrowing from those very methods to come to his own ideas, but also there seems to be a lot more going on than that too kind of getting into myths and tying them in in, in weird ways. So. Well, the, I mean, the young earth creationists do the exact same thing. It's it's a slap and go. In fact, the young earth creationists are doing a, arguably a better job at it than sort of the other pseudoscientific genres because the young earth creationists were like, you know what? We'll make our own journal with blackjack and hookers. And then they were like, answers in Genesis research journal. This is technically peer reviewed. And it's like, I mean, at least it's a better facade of science, right? Like it's it's a better attempt at it. And like, I've seen good faith, I, I do maintain this. I've seen good faith younger creationists do actual science, I've seen it. Um, 
of course, their conclusions were like, not what they wanted. And then they're like, oh, I guess we need to do more investigation. And it's like, yeah, Andrew Snelling, you do. Or like, Todd Wood has done some excellent work. I, I don't want to disparage Todd Wood. Um, but yeah, like it's it's one of those things where, and I keep saying this, but it's because it's it's just true, right? If it's if you're so clearly correct, and there there really is this shadowy scientific community that's pushing its beliefs and pumping it into academia and and brainwashing everyone, then wow, it should be a piece of cake to prove them wrong, and you should be able to present the, them with you know, books upon books of data to show them why they're incorrect. Something as ubiquitously accepted as out of Africa, given the, the genetics and the paleontology behind it, like that would be groundbreaking. Everyone would want to see that. Uh, so if you got that info, this is the time to, as some of the kids say, right? Like not up or shut up, show what you got. Um, <laughs> the <and> kids. <laughs> How I'm old just, are you? You're not too old. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm 26. I'm, I've been told by my students who are like 18 to 21 that I'm like ancient. I, I signed a petition and the guy was like, oh my God, your birthday is almost my birthday. And I was like, oh really? And he's like, yeah, except I was born in 2001. And I was like, wow, I'm getting it up feels- there. <laughs> oh man. Paul was hallucinating. Thank you for this super chat. Paul was hallucinating. I appreciate it. We got another one by Jordan again. Last question. What happened to the previous waves that migrated out before 70,000 years ago? Were they wiped out or do you think they were, there were remnants that lasted and we eventually interbred? It could be either. Given some of these earlier waves were so close in time to like 70,000 to 50,000, like we're, we're getting into, you know, 100,000 years ago, 115. Um, but I don't know how easy it would be to see that in, in the record. I don't know if enough in the genetic record, like I don't know if enough divergence would have occurred that we would have been like, ah, yes. That being said, folks seem to have a pretty good case for certain populations of people coming back into Africa. Uh, and populating sort of the north, um, the north of the continent, north area of the continent. So I can't imagine that it's that it's that difficult. I, so I can't speak to it genetically. But it's probably been done, and I just don't know about it. But paleontologically speaking, I think there's a pretty good case for like humans having you know migrated into kind of these Mediterranean areas, and I think they probably left because they couldn't hack it. Um, the Neanderthals are coming from the north. They're used to you know even if it's mild seasonality, they're used to it. Humans, Homo sapiens, not so much. We, you know, maybe we came ill prepared, but it doesn't look like we stayed for a super long time. I mean, the Neanderthal tenure seems like it was longer. So it seems like it was kind of like a, you know, your cat accidentally gets out and then they're like, oh crap, this is scary. And then they run back in. Um, but that's, that's speculation. I've not worked with this material and, you know, I've only read the literature that's been published and of the paleontology, I should say. Um, so there's quite possibly more info about it out there. I, I would suggest kind of looking into it. The um, again, the it's Apodema, Apodema Cave, the one that is this first kind of excursion out and uh, retreat back. To put it to put it bluntly, what you're actually asking everyone is not to take your word for it, not to take the word of the people necessarily that you're reading, but to investigate why all scientists actually come to certain conclusions. And then if you think they're wrong, overturn it. Show why using the evidence. Don't just don't just throw it out there and act like you've defeated every person out there in the world but you're not really engaging with them in any way i mean that's- no, like, and yeah pr- prove me wrong if if robert deigned to make a video response to this where he's like here's all the reasons erica is wrong i would watch it and i would go and see if he's right because i'm taking the literature's word for a lot of this stuff like i'm still in training i'm still getting my phd right like the work that i've gone out and done is mostly with extant specimens of primates not not extinct hominids so if you want to prove me wrong, like do it. Just, just, you, you know, put your money where your mouth is, right? Like, don't just say, ah, Erica's dumb and stupid and her glasses are ugly and her voice is annoying and whatever. Cause then I'm just going to be like, cool, you don't have an argument and I don't yeah. give a shit. That about shows it. defeat. Yeah. That shows defeat. It's an excuse at that yeah, point. Like, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm pretty good at going tit for tat here. Like if you, for anybody out there who wants to kind of counter me on this, do it. Tell me you've countered me or maybe tell someone else to tell me. I'll take a look at what you got, your criticisms of what I've said here, what I've gotten right, what I've gotten wrong. And I'll give you my thoughts because like that's that's how peer review works. That's how science works. But it's just annoying to, you know, to see people being like it's, it feels like they're wasting my time is what I dislike because I'm just putting the literature again. Like I didn't go out and do all this like lab work myself. 
I just took undergrad genetics, so I understand how genetics works. And I read genetics papers where they're applicable to my field. So go bust us. <laughs> go go overturn the paradigm. Do it. I'm I'm I wait I await your uh I await your reply with bated breath. But in the meantime, like I just I don't really like I don't really care to the to the degree of like people just like busting my chops, like dunking on me unless they're showing up with like an actual here's why you were wrong. And then like my ears are go up and I'm like, oh okay. Let's yeah. see what you see. What you and you're you're almost certain you're wrong about something during this conversation. And uh or at least oh, God, I, I'm wrong all over. the time. Yeah, I misspeak. Like it's possible that you no, know, I've read the, the papers that I present you, like I've read them, but God only knows, like I could have misinterpreted something. I could have said some miss again, misspoke. I I don't know. Or or tomorrow things could change. Like we could find a fossil that turns the whole thing upside down, or you know, a new mechanism in genetics that changes it all. Like science is I said this before, science is science's greatest strength is its mutability, its ability to change. And as scientists, we should seek to be as flexible as the field that we claim to represent. Mm. Well put. Baki says, thank you. I hope I'm saying it right. Baki, Baki, forgive me. Thank you, Gutsit. Thank you, Gutsit. I really I'm appreciate glad you. to be here. I am too. Um, so as we are approaching the end, which went longer than expected, I would like to plug your YouTube channel to let everybody know. Tell us about your channel. Why should everybody go subscribe? Yeah, I mean, for one, because if you're if you're a hater, you can watch all my videos and and you know trash them in the comments section. You know, I, I love to see it. I love to see a little pushback. But I talk a lot about anthropology and primatology, and I dunk on young earth creationism a lot. Um, normally, I'm not doing like going up against the the Roberts of the world with kind of the the alternative history, alternative anthropology takes. Usually, it's young earth creationism stuff because that's right. right in my backyard. So I, I tend to encounter it a lot more frequently. Um, but, you know, if you're wondering, like, how Gutsy Gibbon, you know, does her work or, like, how she gets to the conclusions that she comes to, I do a lot of streams that are, you know, are not, they're not streams, but, like, I, I live record and you can see kind of my process of, like, okay, if I'm curious about this subject or I'm trying to, you know, find out where, you know, this source came from, like, you, you can see my source methods, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so how I go about finding, like, the papers that I came here to present to you today. And you can tell me why those are bad and stupid, actually. Um, yeah. So it's 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 good stuff. But yeah, I, I I try to be as transparent as possible with where I get my information. I think science should not be in an ivory tower. I think it should be open access to all people. And that's kind of what I seek to do with my channel is bring anthropology as I'm experiencing it as a PhD student and primatology as I experienced it as a master's student um, to, to a level where everybody can kind of get in at the ground floor and see how cool it is. Cause I, yeah. I, I'm not in this cause I hate it. I'm in it cause I love it. And I, I want everybody to experience sort of the, the wonder at our place in, in the tree of life. And I guess tangentially, or you related. said it best when? to me in Texas. When oh, I I it. You said this, you, Derek, you're all about these stories. You know, I love the myths. I love the stories in these books, these ancient, writings from our ancestors and whatnot and you said if you love those stories the story of the real story of our evolution as humans will blow your lid off this is so much even more interesting to find out how we made it to where we are now it, it's a myth in and of itself it's so deep it's it, that's one of the things you told me and i was like wow if you look at how we got here and in the past, like the Hobbit men and uh, all sorts of stuff, you make it sound like something I need to look into, of course, further. Well, yeah, I mean, God, well, kind of sounded like maybe I maybe I need to have like a beer on board before I get that eloquent. But because I'm pretty sure I had no, a beer that's on. what you did. You did have a beer. <laughs> I, that 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 would explain it, right? Like I, I get I get much more like I don't know. I, it's it's sensational. It it truly is wonderful and grand um in in their sort of original senses of the word it's the ultimate underdog story uh, for better or for worse and some people will argue it is for better and some for worse but like you know that the it's the human story and i think that everyone can find something to enjoy about it and can find something just truly impeccable about how they came to be where they are today so i don't know i i wish i, I maybe it, uh dang I wish I had beer before this. What was I thinking? I know, right? What were you thinking? Over? I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. You were very, very good. couple super chats before I, I want to close this out. Madalia, good to see you here, and thank you for the love. 
I'm RH negative and there's difficulty in reproduction, transfusions. Where do you think negative and null blood types come from outside of being an adaptation? I don't know. I mean, I think they, they have to be an adaptation. It's, it's, that's kind of why things, that's the only reason things get selected for is if they provide some kind of fitness benefit. I mean, you can really take game theory as we understand it today and apply it to organisms of the past and why they have certain structures or indeed why we have certain traits that we have today. Um, it also could be negative things can sometimes squeak by because they're not negative in one context, but they can be negative in another, right? So like reproduction and transfusions, right? You, you don't have the opportunity to get a transfusion in the past. I mean, so maybe you just, maybe you get the opportunity to reproduce. You reproduce once, you have infertility issues later, you pass that gene on um, and, and it ceases to be, it, it kind of squeaks by. It's like, uh, oh, what's that one? I'm trying to imagine, I'm trying to remember what it is. There are several kind of genetic disorders that don't really come into play until later in life. So you reproduce, you pass the gene on and then you experience the quote unquote consequences later. Um, and in the era of medicine, anything goes. I mean, I've got really narrow hips. I probably wouldn't survive childbirth if, if having children is something that's in my future. It's probably not going to go over well for me unless I get a C-section. And my mom had trouble giving birth to me, right? It's like my lineage wouldn't exist in all likelihood if it wasn't for modern medicine. So I don't know. It's it's the, With the RH negative stuff, you, you almost have to take it in context with like human cultural advances as well and how we've allowed for... And I am so thankful for this, for, for people who maybe have disadvantages, medically speaking, to live long, full, happy lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madalia. And thank you for answering that. Robert Herring said penance. <laughs> thank you for the super chat. Um, another thing for those who love what you heard today and you're watching this now or later, if you want to support what she's doing, I, I really recommend getting behind the people and creating the relationships. Become part of the family. <laughs> become part of the hominid family. I know you're not one, but you can become, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, seriously though, you can, you can join her Patreon. She has different levels. Half the words she says, I don't understand, but it's okay. Cause she's talking and uh, no, seriously, go subscribe to her Patreon. You can message her and she's got tons of content. Tell us about your Patreon real quick. I got to plug it. I have to, you're muted. Is that better? That's better. That knocked my microphone and my like <laughs> my is really iffy. It depends on the day. Yeah, if you want to support the channel, you can go to the Patreon. Uh, there are a bunch of different levels, and people who are a part of the Patreon get access to videos like weeks before I end up releasing them. And sometimes I'm like really just nailing a weekend. I just get three videos done, slap those bad boys on the Patreon, and then they don't release for a month. And other times, you know, it's a dry spell for me, and I'm I'm barely getting videos out on time. Um, but the Patreon is a great way to support the channel. I think it gets a name at the end of the video. Um, and something that's, I guess I should say, communicating with me is best over email. So it's gutsagibbon at gmail.com. If you want to send me hate mail, be mean to me, or give me a sweet compliment. Um, and if you're a patron, I tell people who are in the Patreon to put the word patron in their subject line. I respond to those first. So you do get priority communication, but just not through Patreon. Um, I so yeah, I, I have actually had people who very much dislike me sign up for my Patreon just so they can tell me that they dislike me. And I'm like, thanks for the cash, pal. Awesome. Love yeah, I mean, people are going to disagree, <laughs> right? It, it's, it's cool to see that someone's willing to even do that though. I mean, if they're going to want to, I mean, hopefully it's not harassment, but like disagreements <laughs> is cool. Like, you know, uh, yeah, I'd like to see some people go and support you. Like you kick butt today. And I, I, can't imagine what we didn't talk about how many videos are on the channel that if we actually went through investigating the content using my background and researching the mythologies from experts in the field to you as a <laughs> taking approach on anthropology and evolution and such what would we like drop our jaws at and have plenty of content to discuss you know uh, I, I can't imagine. And so I don't plan on doing that. This was a one-time type of thing for now. I'm not saying I won't have future stuff. Maybe if there's a response, cool. We'll have something to talk about, but, um, Sweet. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm always game. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I, I love a good back and forth. I don't, I don't tend to take things super personally. It's the internet. People are crazy on the internet. Um, I can get a little, little spicy myself as you, as you've seen today. 
Um, but yeah, like I, if, if there's response to this, I'd love to come back on and talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll bring my sources again and new ones. If it's something new comes up, it's, that's the beauty of, uh, that's the beauty of dialogue, right? Get to discuss yep. dissenting opinions in the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> yeah. I look, let me see. I, sometimes I do this with my fans that are like watching. I'll refresh just to see if someone went and supported you just during our live stream. I like to check and see you gained one, one, one patron. Already. Oh, sweet. Thank you very much. Already. So let me post that just so everybody knows. I love to hear a success, success story whenever I do these lives to see, you know, people go support uh, guests that I have on. We're like to keep content coming out. And then last of all, I must mention, we have a Patreon. Uh, right now I'm putting together an idea because I've got so many videos buried down in my Patreon that I want to do a refresh and bring a lot of those forward. But lots of the contents early release. I also communicate through the messaging. You can, you can literally message me over here, private chat me on Patreon, harass me, ask me what I ate for dinner. Uh, people literally contact me because I'm a recovering drug addict and now I'm almost seven years off heroin to talk about oh, their yeah. struggles and stuff. So there's always something there and you can hang out with the family there. Also, you might have an academic or a scholar for me to investigate. There's ways to contact me. So thank you, Erica, for like kicking butt, taking names. Really, I didn't expect us to go this deep, but we did. Nah, dude, I, I, it's my pleasure as always. I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, I, it's, it's genuinely, you know, what I do on YouTube is a passion project. So it's like, I'm here cause I enjoy it. And you know, people can disagree. That's, that's part of the human condition. Um, it's what we seek to understand. So, you know, shoot, if you disagree with what I said today, like shoot me an email. Um, we can talk about it, but my caveat is always like, if you're just talking trash or you're making claims without supporting it, I'm not into that. And I'm probably just going to stop replying. So, right. you know, I don't know, but yeah, but I had a ball and, uh, thank you for having me on. This was sweet. And, and those who are watching this, hit the like button because I can almost guarantee you the cabal of Sefer fans is disliking the crap out of this video. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for- Ooh, I hope they come over to my channel, baby. Come on. Let's let's have a conversation. <laughs> I got my mods on the lookout already. So, you know, good, good, good faith criticism stays. Um, yeah. Acting like a weenie in my comment section does not. You're, you're so tough. I mean, like, just <laughs> that's, that's why I wear my black jacket that makes my shoulders look bigger. So I can intimidate. <laughs> like, like you talked about the primates and you were talking about how that's a, an evolutionary thing that. Oh yeah. We expand. puff ourselves up. Yeah. Puff yeah. out my chest. Bear my canine teeth. Uh, just so yeah. everyone knows, you know, with, when you got a voice like mine, you gotta, you gotta compensate in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> seriously thank you so much ladies and gentlemen never forget we are myth vision and check out that description for all the sources don't any of you have that guts to play for blood i'm your huckleberry that's just my game